Hello everyone, this is Ilonzo. Want to know how to get your first cloud job? Then please register for our webinar. We'll teach you everything that you need to know and answer your questions along the way. Hope to see you there. All right, everybody. So I know you're used to watching all this pre-roll stuff and not paying attention, but pay attention. There's all kinds of stuff happening over the next few months. We've got people from NVIDIA. We have people from AWS. We have free boot camps. So watch all this pre-roll stuff so you know what's going on. Hello everyone, this is Ilonzo. Want to know how to get your first cloud job? Then please register for our webinar. We'll teach you everything that you need to know and answer your questions along the way. Hope to see you there. Hello everyone, this is Ilonzo. Want to know how to get your first cloud job? Then please register for our webinar. We'll teach you everything that you need to know and answer your questions along the way. Hope to see you there. My name is Richard Furr, and I can say I am cloud hired. That yes, come and try and get cloud hired. I'm cloud hired. I'm cloud hired. I'm cloud hired. Hey, go, go cloud architect family. I'm cloud hired. I'm cloud hired, guys. So I'll just say I'm cloud hired. I'm cloud hired. I'm cloud hired. Thanks to go cloud architects. It worked for me. And now I'm cloud hired. Because because of Google Architect program, I am cloud hired. See! I am cloud hired. Thank you, Mike and the Glue Cloud team. Hi everyone, this is Mike Gibbs, the founder and CEO of Go Cloud Careers, here with my C level team. My chief operating officer, Christopher Johnson. My chief of content, Alonzo Coleman. We're here today to talk about a lot of fun things related to cloud architects versus cloud engineers because so many people want these great roles. And of course, we'll talk about other cloud technology roles as well. 
But, you know, the cloud engineer versus the cloud architect thing is probably the most misconfused concept, which keeps people from getting cloud hired. And, you know, I want to get the entire world cloud hired. So because of that, I want you to be armed with the right information, knowing exactly what hiring managers want in the perfect employee so you can get cloud hired at any time. So we'll talk about what is a cloud engineer and a cloud architect to make you really understand it. We'll talk about how to become a cloud architect or how to become a solution architect. We'll go over cloud engineer career paths. And trust me, you can do a lot to maximize a cloud engineering career as well. And I've helped people do that for decades now. And that way, you'll know what cloud architect training is versus cloud engineer training. We'll talk about cloud architect career guidance, cloud engineer career guidance, and pretty much anything we can. Oh, and if you want to know how to become a cloud engineer from scratch or how to become a cloud architect from scratch, we got you covered there too. So let's make this really, really fun. We have so many things going on. I'm going to turn it over to Christopher Johnson, and then he can talk about all the cool stuff we have going on. All right. Yeah. So now I'm in charge. I love it. So uh, let's get this first question out of the way. Diggleman asks, is Mike doing a Q&A tonight? <laughs> kind of, sort of. I knew yeah. that was going to come up. <laughs> We're going to try to keep it a little controlled here. But, uh, but anyway, so yeah, so let me tell you guys and girls and men and women all about what we've got coming up. So as everybody knows, we had the first day of our AWS Certified Solutions Architect Associate Boot Camp today. Uh, you can find the link to that on our, on our channel. But what I would like to make sure everyone does is get your copy of the new and updated AWS exam guide. Um, I'll have Leo or someone from the team post a link to the exam guide in the chat box so that you can get that and you can use that to go right along with us on the boot camp. So uh, Leo, if you will put the link to that, in, there it is. I see it there. Fine. It's in the chat box for everybody to get. So this is new and updated for the new version of the associate exam. Uh, we use this exam guide for both our associate and professional exams. We cover everything you need, and we, uh, we cover it from a level of uh, actually understanding the, uh, the technology. So there is that for you. Next thing I want to tell everybody about is our um, Thursday, How to Get Your First Cloud Job webinar. We will be doing that this Thursday. Normally, we do it at 1 o'clock. Um, but this week we'll be doing it there in the morning on Thursday because of the boot camp. But please register for that. Join us so that you can learn exactly how to go about getting your first cloud job. Whether you want to do it with us or you want to do it on your own, we're going to tell you exactly how to do that and tell you all our secrets and you can, you can be on your way to getting cloud hired. So make sure to register for that and actually join us. So don't just register and and then uh, and then think, all right, I'm going to get cloud hired. You, you, get, you show up and uh, and take advantage of the the knowledge and experience that we have to share with you to hopefully save you some mistakes. A lot of the information we'll be sharing here, but uh, kind of hit or miss as we respond to questions. On Thursday, it'll be very straightforward. You will be able to take notes and you will be able to get exactly where you need to be. So. Uh, the next thing that I want to remind everybody of is uh, I want you guys to follow us on LinkedIn. Um, most of you are where we had originally scheduled for uh, Alvin DaCosta, who is a vice president at NVIDIA with their global partners. Uh, he was originally scheduled for today, but unfortunately, as, a, as often happens with the high-level executives, they, he had some <laughs> last-minute uh, changes to his schedule that we we had to accommodate. So we make sure to follow us on LinkedIn so that you can get all of our updates and notifications, including when we're going to have him reschedule. Um, it looks like right now, it looks like it will be next next week, but we're not 100%. So make sure to follow us on LinkedIn. And again, that's where we're going to share all our information. We share information about upcoming shows, upcoming guests, upcoming boot camps, discounts, uh, new exam guides, new content, new videos, new anything. We always put it up there on LinkedIn. So make sure you're following us on LinkedIn. And then the last thing that I want to make sure to let everyone know about is 
that we do have a uh, we do have a discount going on right now uh, at, since it is Cybersecurity Awareness Month. Um, I'm really not sure who comes up with these months, but it's <laughs> Cybersecurity Awareness Month. And so since it's Cybersecurity Awareness Month, we have a 30% discount code on our training content, everything from our interview mastery program to our tech career accelerator leadership program and our cloud architect career development program. That 30% discount will apply on all programs and it will apply on all payment plans. So every payment in a payment plan, that discount will be applied, not just the first one. So that is a 30% off discount with the code word security. And um, those are all the things that I have to bring up. Alonzo, anything that you want to bring in before we, uh, before we kick it off? Well, I think you cleared it all, but I'm, I'm really interested in jumping into this conversation with Mike uh, regarding confer- a career confusion and, and trying to help everyone to avoid a couple of pitfalls, get some clarification on expectations of roles and so that we can help fortify everyone for their best career ever. And it's really about knowing and getting there. Chris, Alonzo, how often do we get someone that's never worked in tech, their first tech job as a solution architect? Uh, every week, at least once or twice. Yeah. <laughs> if, if, we're, if we're going down, we don't have to fingers. Is, if we're going yeah. down to just people with no experience. Yeah. At least, at least one a week. I know that. Yeah. Um, we're general, not referring to total. We get a lot more people. Yeah. Total, time. we yeah. get, we get, we get more. But but it, pretty much got, one a week. Well, maybe two a week for somebody working at a shoe store, worked as a waiter in a restaurant, worked as a mental health tech that we're getting hired with zero experience. Exactly. Yeah. With that, with the caveat of no tech experience, like. All they know how to do is turn it on and off. Then, yeah, probably. <laughs> and there's a lot of secrets when, doing when that. We, when we spread that out to people, anyone, it's probably it's like every day. Um, yeah, it's every day with everyone. But you know, there's a secret and a recipe to doing that. And part of that is, you know, being great at your job, and being so competent at your job, and having a certain set of other attributes, which we'll talk about tonight, that'll make an employer look at you and say, "I need you." versus let me try and interview 400 other people and see who I like best. Right. Yeah, I don't have enough time to interview the 400 other people. So if I'm interviewing you, then I know that I want you. Like you, you, you have whatever you presented to me indicates that you've got it. So if, you, if I interview you and say you don't have experience, then that's, that's a bunch of BS. But anyway, <laughs> uh, I know Alonzo has, has curated, I think, probably any, like five to ten of our most common questions that we we get, um, whether it be on YouTube or whether it be through email or whether it be on the phone. I'm sure some of you have spoken to Alonzo on the phone. Alonzo likes to answer our phone. So, <laughs> um, so but before I get to Alonzo's question, there is one that I want to bring up uh, that came in during the boot camp. And it, it came in a couple of times during the boot camp today in some way, shape, or form. And um, But that question is, what is the difference between what we're doing this week on YouTube and the boot camp? What's the difference between that and our training program? And I'll explain it quickly. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to explain what is a cloud architect or a solution architect versus what is taught in certifications. And then after that, if you want, I'm going to also talk about the wonderful cloud engineering career and what that is versus what's taught in certifications. So when you take a certification, really what you're learning is the name of a vendor service and how to configure those vendor-specific services. Now, here's the problem. Cloud architects and solution architects don't configure. It's not even 1% of their job. We had someone from AWS here just the other day, and he said he's not even allowed to touch touch the customer's technology. He's not allowed to. Look, I've been an architect for 25 years. The only thing we don't do is touch the technology, but I'm going to tell you what we do do. Um, And I'll tell you why. So as an architect, really what your job is going to be as as follows. And this is why a cloud architect versus a cloud engineer are so different. Both equally good roles, but different. As a cloud architect, my goal and my focus is how do I improve a customer's business performance? That's it. Just like a management consultant or a strategy consultant would do, how do you improve your customer's business performance? It's a pure hands-off consulting role. And my tool 
to help create a new architecture for that business is technology. It could be an ice machine. It could be a cloud-based technology, a data center-based technology, a phone-based technology, a video-based. It doesn't matter. Our job as a cloud architect is to go solve those customers' business problems with technology. So the, what we teach, which is the critical skills, is to be an architect, unless you have an MBA or you have the kind of training like we provide, you're not going to be able to get these roles because it requires a certain level of business acumen. I'm going to tell you right now, I trained a 21-year-old Daniel Bosu, who was a high school dropout who's now working as a solution architect with J.P. Morgan Chase Bank. And he's the son I always wanted. He's truly an amazing person, and he learned the skills we taught him. But when a customer says, I'd like to increase sales or minimum wage or just went up, I need to automate so I can lay off people or inflation is high and I need to lay off these 30 engineers and replace them by outsourcing to a lower cost part of the world. Your job as an architect is to think, how do you make that possible? If you're dealing with the bank and the bank's telling you that if they had a nanosecond of competitive advantage on processing a trade through their algorithmic trading program could equal another billion dollars a year, it's your job to think about how you could make that happen. Now, the first two things that are required are the business skills. And the next set of series that are required are the technical skills. And then we'll talk about the leadership skills and why. So as a cloud architect, I've got to go interview my client. Now, I'm going to be asking the CEO and the CTO and the CIO all about the things that are related to their business from a strategy perspective. I'm then going to be talking to uh, department heads, VPs, hiring managers, and ground-level engineers. So I'm going to need to have a lot of diverse communication skills. I'm going to need to have something called CXO relevancy. I'll tell you how important it is. When I was at Cisco, I took at least $10,000 of training just to be more CXO relevant. How do you present and relate to the CEO, CFO, CTO? Now, if you don't speak their language, you don't get the business requirements, which means you can't design the architecture and it's all dead. It's just wasted technology in a heap pile somewhere that somebody spent money on. Now, I also have to sell that technology back. And I don't sell it to engineers. They don't write the paycheck. So I have to convince the CTO, the CIO, the CFO, and the CEO that I need your $100 million. And that comes from board business acumen. Now, trust me, in my last 25 years as an architect, nobody's ever told me, Mike, I want this $1.1 billion architecture because I want to spend it. Now, when I've worked on $1 billion plus architectures, it's all about how do we fix that business? Which means we need to understand the business and we need to be really great leaders because no one person designs a billion dollar architecture. It's leading a team of 50 to 500, bringing all the best and brightest minds together to get them all work together. Like my favorite African proverb says, if you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, go together. This is go together every way, shape, or form. So the, the architect needs to lead that team. Now, you don't just get 50 people in your company that cost $200,000 a year and say, I'm borrowing for the next nine months. You have to go back to your company and build a business case and show your executives why they need to give you these people. So now there's that. Now, the next thing that we've got to talk about is how do you go maneuver through an organization and just get 10, 20, 30 million dollars of resources as needed to go do your experiments? Now, that comes in your sales skills, but it also comes in your schmoozing abilities, your emotional intelligence, and your soft skills. So without ex extensive training in these roles, the reality is they're not possible. Now, I'm going to tell you right now, it cost me a quarter million dollars to learn those skills. Between what I paid for both master's degrees and all the professional training, my companies thankfully paid for a lot of it. I also got some grants for some of it. I was really grateful and I always will be. And I teach these things as part of our Cloud Architect Career Development Program for the following reasons. It makes my students step out, and I know most students can't afford the education to do these things. It would be thirty to $50,000. And if you want to go from no experience to cloud hired, you got to be so good in every way. And that's why, for example, we have four MBAs on our team. We've got someone with a master's degree in law, a master's degree in education, 
and a master's degree in economics. Now, we also have two PhD business school professors as part of our program. So we can teach these skills at that elite level. Why do we charge so little? Because I don't need to work. And we kind of run this course at our cost. We're barely above that just so we can keep growing and funding the business and taking really great care of our students. Now, the cloud architect, once you get past those business skills, doesn't touch the technology. We don't configure things that are taught like in a certification. We design the end-to-end -end solution. Now, what are we designing? You can't design what you don't understand, okay? And I know this sounds crazy, but we've got Certified Solution Architect Associate Training, and what they do, they basically give you the name EC2, and they don't tell you what's going on under the hood. Now, we've been using the same EC2 instances. We used to call them VMware things, KVM, QEMU. It doesn't matter which hypervisor we've been using. We've been using this for 20-some years in the data center. But, you know, they don't want you to know what's going on because you can charge more when fancy brands and things. So certifications are taking you the name of a service. But if you use that service in front of your customer, unfortunately, you're going to be walked out the door by security and fired because you're not going to look like a trusted advisor. You're going to look like you're trying to sell stuff. Now, let's talk about if you were a chef and you had to create a recipe. I love Jamaican food, okay? I eat a lot of Jamaican food. And I love this thing called bami, which is uh, basically uh, you take cassava or yaka, you grind it out, you make it into a patty. I like rice and peas. I like jerk chicken. And I love turmeric tea. And I do have some Trinidadian hot sauce in my refrigerator as well. But, you know, that's the kind of food I like. That's me. Now, I got to tell you, if I invited my American buddy from Philadelphia and didn't know, tell him what jerk spice was, didn't tell him how to soak bami, didn't tell him you know, what, how do you make turmeric tea, how do you do any of this stuff, well, let's face it, you don't. So but the architect role is not how to cook it, it's how to design the menu like a chef would. So kind of keep that. So now let's go into the tech piece. Am I the tech piece? Uh, well, I, I was going to say, Mike. So for those of us that are sh that that have very short attention spans, <laughs> the question that that I want to make sure we give a quick and short answer to: What's the difference between the boot camp we're doing this week and our training program? Well, our training program sixty teaches seconds all or less. <laughs> Our training program teaches all of the things necessary for the career, which is all the things that I'm describing. And I haven't even gotten to the architecture piece of the training piece or what's needed for the architect. I just talked about the business skills part, and we teach all of those business skills. But let's be fair. What we do is we do architecture training three times per week in class, which is live, where we teach you how to assemble the pieces and parts to build an entire solution. So it's not configuration training. It's architecture training. In our classes, we teach you how to design the systems, and you can't design what you don't know. So what I was going to get into before is what is that technology? We will teach you all the technologies that make the cloud possible because you can't tune performance if you don't understand. You also can't migrate the stuff from the data center to the cloud. So, of course, we teach how to do migrations. Now, of course, you've got to sell it back. So we make our architects do presentation skills. Of course, in the role, you respond to RFIs, RFPs, RFQs, and we give writing projects for the, our students for this up. And then, you know, to get our people training, no one cares if you told somebody you set up an EC2 instance or an S3 bucket. I taught an eight-year-old to do it in less than five minutes. But our students build the cloud, I mean, from scratch. So our students understand every level of the cloud to the point where they build the cloud in our data center remotely. Every one of our students, if they wanted to, could design AWS or Google or Azure from scratch. We teach them how to design their clouds. And then after that, we give our students real world work and real world projects. And we spend hundreds of hours doing it. Our students do homework. They turn it in. We give them feedback on it. We teach our students how to optimize their resume. Our students don't even need to apply for jobs. Recruiters hammer them while they're in the program. And the biggest question for me is, Mike, how do I tell the recruiters I'm not ready yet? How often do you guys see that? So we do that. Now we teach a student how to. There's, a, there's an entire channel in our in the yeah. Slack community dedicated to, dedicated how, to, tell, to how to tell recruiters no. <laughs> and, and, and because it's our, our students, we do this now. We do a lot of marketing and branding for our students. For example, I was in 60 magazines so far this year. I don't want to be in magazines. 
But people know that my students that go trained by us, because of the branding we do for them and the skills they have, they're out there. So I write publications for the world to know my students as being great. And then we teach our students how to interview, how to negotiate a higher salary. Just last week, one of our students negotiated an additional $20,000. Pretty good for a course that he paid $700 for with the discount. Hmm. So is yeah, that I like quick that. enough? I like, Chris? That. I, like that. I like that return on investment model yeah. there. And that yeah. was just for the raise, let that's alone. Just the, that's just for the That was just when he negotiated, let alone the additional. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, the difference in the job offer but between the job offer and the acceptance. Not just not 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 even including the base pay. <laughs> then he had a six figure raise <laughs> and then negotiated an additional twenty. Right. The return on investment for just that additional twenty, not counting the not counting the think about what you can do with just that boat at that markup, that twenty yeah. percent. And apply right. that can compare to other salaries. Crazy. All right. So, um, so yeah. So let's see. Um, you know what? I'm just gonna I'm gonna do I'm I'm just gonna do this because Diggleman has been coming to our career Q and A's, and we, we've not uh, we've not done this we, we've not taken this question because it's a tech related question. But I'm gonna throw him a bone. <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna give him. We're going to give another 60 seconds. He's been very diligent. So, Mike, could you explain we'll RAID as it relates to architects? Yeah, sure. So, Dingleman, as architects, we need to make sure that our disk performance is optimal for the customer's business requirement. And when you're on the cloud, you can't get a fast enough storage unless you do something else. So, what RAID is, it's a redundant array of disks. It used to be inexpensive disks. Where basically, it's like load sharing between drives at the same time. By load sharing, we can increase our performance. So instead of writing to one hard drive, RAID enables you to write to two drives, three drives, four drives. And by doing it, it's like having more oarsmen or oarswomen inside of the bow. You can row faster. And and he apologized, but th there's no reason to apologize, Diggleman. It's just that's the type of stuff that we cover in in our program, and, and also that we covered in in our boot camps and special things and we actually covered raid in our boot camp today i'm not mm -hmm. not sure if you were able to attend it but if you watch the recording of the boot camp i believe it's in the last hour um when we're discussing discussing storage and raid in today's boot camp recording so you'll be able to get a little bit more from that but no reason to apologize it never hurts to try and ask questions the worst we can say is no and come back and that you know that that's how it is um but mike so, i know i know you like to present and i know that you like to talk a lot well, i just want people to understand the careers so they know how to get hired i understand so you, you talked you talked a lot about the cloud architect role and i know we didn't get into the tech a lot which is actually good <laughs> that we didn't get into the tech and i know alonzo's got a lot of questions over there and i want to address one question that came in just because it's troubling to me I was about to. Uh, Nobody uh, is ever required to buy any of our courses. We do free uh, courses to help those that are out there in the community. And uh, nobody is ever required. We have paid courses to help people go from certified to hired, which is a very, very different thing. Mm -hmm. But we'll also be willing to tell you everything you need to learn to get hired. And I just talked about 50% of what's needed to get hired for the cloud architect, which is not covered in certification. I also didn't cover the technical requirements that are necessary, which again, none of which are covered in certification. But having said that, you, nobody's ever any required to buy any of our things. We put as much free content out as we can for, for free. Yeah. free. Look up at the top. Look up at the top. We give away our entire secret on Thursday. Yeah. And we, we give out. We give out. We give out our entire roadmap on Thursday. Yes. And it's it's the it's probably it probably does not help us for sales purposes, but I know we know people that have done our entire program without being in our program because they let them know everything that we have to say and they figure it out and they're able to implement and the biggest thing the biggest thing is focus dedication to the dedication and focus so anyway so like mike said you don't have to um so anyway i was going to ask and then lincoln put it in here as well could you go over cloud engineer a little bit before we get into Alonzo's questions? Yeah, let me finish the cloud architect and then get into the cloud engineer. I got a timer 
Don't go too long. <laughs> no, how long do you like to go? So the cloud architect is basically tasked with a way to improve the customer's business performance. Now we've got to get to the tech, right? Because people think the tech. We don't configure the tech. We put the pieces and parts together in the same way a chef would design a menu. So in order to do this, you need to understand what tech it is that you're moving. And what are you moving? Network and data center tech. What is a cloud? And network and data center. They're all the same, and all my students build one from scratch. So once you deal with this, you're dealing with networking things, which is BGP. It's IP addressing, subnetting, supernetting, route summarization. It's... Uh, Interior gateway protocols such as OSPF to some degree because you need that for IBGP to work. It's what WAN technology you're going to be doing as a cloud architect. Using when do you use a VPN versus a private line versus Ethernet over MPLS versus software defined networking or SaaS. And then it's determining, you know, how you're going to engineer your traffic and the things that are associated with that. Now, part of what would fall under the cloud architect role is also. The data set, well, actually switching technologies such as VLANs, VLAN tagging, VLAN trunking, and then there's the switching technologies pieces, which really means like spanning tree rapid, spanning tree link aggregation groups. And then it's ARP and proxy ARP, DNS, DHCP. Now, still, we got to design data center stuff because what are we doing? We're moving a virtual machine from one cloud to another cloud, which means you need to understand servers and server virtualization containers and container orchestration, storage area and networks in depth load balancers, business applications that can modify or impact business performance, and security, which is not going to be used by your cloud provider. It's going to be enterprise-grade security stuff like his next generation firewalls, IDS, IPS systems. And for us, that's our requisite knowledge. When you know that, you can pass a AWS professional architect exam in literally two days with nothing. You can pass that certified solution architect professional policy in two days. I did it for the Google one. It's nothing when you know these things. So now once you get past that, the architecture piece is how do you put them together, which means which vendors do you combine? How do you deal with the multi-cloud environment? So the cloud architect designs the solution, presents the solution, and those are the technical skills. Now the cloud architect will never touch the technology. They're not even allowed to in most cases. When we interview hiring managers, they say, don't give me a cloud engineer. I don't want a techie. That we get called by CEOs and CTOs and hiring managers, and they all tell us, please don't send me an engineer as an architect. I want someone that's a business executive that kind of can put in front of C-level audiences that have the technology background to design, present, and sell. That's what I did as an architect for 25 years. Now, let's talk about the cloud engineer career. It's another great career. It really is. And what does the cloud engineer do? Well, the cloud architect like me really builds a blueprint. It's a strategy for all the pieces and parts that get together. The cloud engineer is like the construction crew. They are magic, highly educated people that take my blueprint and build, bring it to life by building it. Now, no cloud engineer is going to be doing what's taught in the certification training where they're going to click on a punch of box in the management console. There's no point. But when the cloud engineer brings all that stuff, those virtual machines to the cloud, they're going to be the ones setting it up. So it's taught in the certified solution architect professional might be about 7 to 8% of what a cloud engineer needs to know. They still need to know all those networking and data center things from the architect to some degree how they work because they're going to go be building them. So they still need to know networking. Now, the cloud engineer is going to be doing so much building, and they're going to operating system primarily they're going to be building Linux. So they've got to pretty much be Linux engineers as well. And I don't mean a Linux certification. I mean Linux engineers, deep, good, hands-on Linux admin people. Now, when these cloud engineers are going to build stuff or maintain stuff, they're not going to be clicking boxes. They're going to have to automate it. And they're going to automate some stuff with simple bash cell script, other stuff in Python, potentially Windows PowerShell scripts. And then they're going to be deploying things with infrastructure as code. And nobody's going to be using CloudFormation templates in today's world. They're going to be using Terraform because there's no such thing for the most part as a single cloud environment. Most customers are now multi-cloud and those that aren't are trying to go multi-cloud. So now it's Terraform. So you can see that that cloud architect is all about designing and presenting and selling and designing things. 
And this cloud engineer is all about building things. And why can't, does the training not work? Well, if you wanted to be an architect and design a building, and if instead of going to architecture school, I handed you a hammer, a screwdriver, and a nail driver, and said, here, I'm teaching you construction. Do you think that person would have any knowledge on how to design a hotel, for example? Of course not. And when you take a cloud architect like me, and then you say, go build this, we're not going to know what to do. And we're not going to know what to do because our focus is someplace different. So I know uh, we'll, um, we'll talk about focus and things like that, but I just wanted to briefly cover, if I could do brief, what a cloud architect is versus a cloud engineer. Because I, I don't want you learning your own skills. If you can be brief. Well, Mike, Mike I, I think this is going to be a perfect time to segue in because you're very detailed. You're very, you, you get down to the molecules of, of, of the conversation. But I'm thinking right now is the time to ask you, you, you've expounded on cloud architecture, the, the responsibilities, the expectations, and you also flipped a coin on cloud engineering roles and the same thing goes for that. Is there a role that can give you the best of both worlds? And I've seen a lot of, 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 of peripheral questions adding, can I take the engineering course as well as the architecture course to make some sort of unicorn? But could you express and explain why that is not a good idea? Exactly. So these roles have very specific purposes. If my goal as a cloud architect is to figure out how to get my customers to earn more, and I divert my attention to how can I learn more about engineering about this widget, this cloud thing, my focus and all my efforts and energy are not on digital transformation. They're all about building something. Likewise, I need my architects to focus on business and business performance and selling to executives. By comparison, I need my engineers to be focused on making sure the tech works, not schmoozing, not getting drunk with their clients, not spending all their time golfing with their clients. And I'm not joking, not attending meetings all day long not attending leadership courses. I need my engineers to be rock stars to make it work. And unfortunately, you know, you can't pilot an airplane and take care of the patients in the back and, that, and make sure they're safe. And that's why they have airplane pilots and flight attendants because the roles are different. And here's the problem. When you try and focus on both, you become horrible at everything because your focus is divided. Now, if any of you watch the American sport called baseball, you'll notice that the people that pitch, which are paid millions of dollars a year, can never hit the ball. There's a reason for that. Their goal is to pitch. Nobody's hiring them to hit the ball and nobody cares. Now you could train that pitcher to hit the ball just as good as anybody else, but you know what? They won't be training as much time to be a pitcher and they'll be bad at it. Now that's why martial artists don't become marathon runners because they're training for speed, power, and agility versus going long and slow and distance all day. So you can't do both. And when you try to do both, you become horrible at both. That makes a lot of sense, Mike. And being able to share with them that you shouldn't have to worry about, I think the overall concern is how can I compound my, my value, compound my salary, create that value for myself, for my children, family, and so forth. And I believe that you focus on one, become a, a grandmaster at being an engineer, be a grandmaster at being an architect. And once you become that go-to person that everyone wants on their transformation projects, that's where your bonuses are going to kick in. That's where more of your value is going to be shown. So you don't have to worry about trying to uh, go east and west at the same time. And, you know, for my international friends, I don't know much about cricket, but I believe the one that hits the ball versus the one that pitches the ball, they have to be focused on one or the other, right? Help me out to those who, 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 who play cricket. If I'm right, I hope so. But everyone has a job to do. Everyone has to focus on being who they're meant to be and not try to uh, be a mole and an eagle at the same time, if you will. So I appreciate that, Mike. And here's what happens. You know, when I take an architect that's a cloud architect and we train him with leadership skills, you know, that architect easily can earn three hundred, four hundred, five hundred thousand dollars a year. Yeah. Now, when that architect focuses on engineering skills, their management views them as more of an engineer and they don't get past that hundred and eighty thousand dollar career. 
likewise, the, now the, actually for engineers, kind of the converse is true. If you train an engineer in soft skills and executive presence and leadership communication, you turn into a principal engineer or a distinguished engineer, and now they've got a quarter of a million dollar role. But it always comes down to soft skills, leadership skills, communication skills. The more of that you know, the more you're going to earn in your tech career versus focusing on the tech. We can always find a techie. Okay. It's hard to find someone that can use the tech to truly impact business performance. Those people and those that can communicate it well are the most elite. And could you um, uh, expound on, uh, we're going back into the, to the boardroom, going back to that, that conference room where um, uh, business owners are looking for solutions. And could you tell with your experience why business owners, the, the engineers drive them nuts by getting into the minutiae of, of tech? Yeah, and honestly, I've seen a lot of, uh, it's sad, I've seen a lot of engineers escorted out of rooms and fired so for this exact reason. And that's why organizations often are very hesitant to take engineers and put them into architect roles unless they've got, they've got some leadership behind them. And I can give examples of that. So I'm the CEO of a company. Now, the reality is I don't care which one can, can pass, t pass you know, messages between it any faster than the other. I care about does it support my business needs? Is it the solution that's right for my business? Can I trust it? Is it secure? Is it going to work? Otherwise, I don't care at all. What's my goal as a CEO? I'll tell you one thing. As a, and a CEO of a publicly traded company, their goal is to increase shareholder value. That means higher revenues, lower expenses. Otherwise, the CEOs can be put in prison. I'm literally not joking. Now, for me as a CEO, I care about a couple of things. My students getting cloud hired. I wouldn't be doing this. I'd be retired like I was retired if I wasn't about getting my students cloud hired. So number one, I care that our students are cloud hired. Number two, I'm running, I make sure that the business has revenue to pay all the employees we have so we can hire the best. And number three, as a business, I make sure that the technology works. And, you know, I have a lot of team to make sure that the technology works. Why do I care the technology works? If it doesn't, my students aren't going to be VPNing into the data center and building their own clouds, and my students won't be learning. So I just care that things work. Now, I don't care if one's better than the other technology-wise, one's faster than the other. I don't even care if one's cheaper than the other, to the most part, if I can trust in the solution and have faith that my students are going to get cloud hired by having the right technology. That's what I care about. Uh, I want to chime in here just to piggyback off of something that you said earlier. And you tell me if I'm going down the right path here, because remember, I'm not uh, as a, uh, I'm not a techie. I, I don't know anything about technology. Um, so it, it's it's a lot like that that person at the restaurant. They they don't care how the food got to their restaurant mm -hmm. they they may care about what like the original or uh where it originally oriented from but they have no they don't care how it got from point a to point b as long as they got from point a to point b in the amount of time that it was supposed to get there yep <laughs> they yeah. don't care what mode of transportation how many different transfers it had how many different drivers how many the trouble the driver had and at the previous stop they, they don't exactly. they don't care about all that stuff it, it's so true like the executive or the business owner yeah they care about the end results and are the or for most of us especially us at go cloud careers making sure that we're getting to the end results the correct right way but not worrying about every single little little thing uh yeah. it's safe to say it's that you continuing on that restaurant comparison that you were making earlier, Mike, is that a safe? Uh... It's perfect. Like if tonight I'm going to, my wife's away. I usually do the cooking, but she's away. I'll use Uber Eats. I don't care how it gets to me. Mm -hmm. I don't care where those people are coming from. The person that, that, that's bringing it to me, the person's name even. I mean, if they came to the door and I'd like to say hello, that I'd get, but I don't care any about it. I just care that my Miller's Ale House cheeseburger is coming. I think that's the one thing that I usually get as a treat if I talk late on Tuesday night. But, you know, I don't care about the rest of it. If I were, wasn't focused on my students getting hired and building elite training, and I was focused on the tech, my students wouldn't be getting hired because I wouldn't be focused on it. So that's about what do you do directly focused to improving your career? 
Yeah. And, and Mike, could you create that peripheral as well when it comes to um, business owners? They don't want the long story. They okay. want those bullet points the same way they want an executive summary. That's how they communicate. And could you share those relationships? Yeah, honestly, I can tell you the, the, the following things. When you truly are the CEO of a company, nobody can truly imagine what it feels like. I promise you. I remember in my youth, I was in networking, and I'd get into so the CEO's office. No, just tell me. This was like 20-some years ago, and I would do it. And I was like, how, think in my head, how could this person that's so smart not be able to do stuff? Fast forward 25 years, I get 3,000 emails a day. Thousands of messages all across social media platforms, calls from every country you could possibly imagine in the day, and I'm live on camera. And now it's like, Chris, is the tech going to work? Did you set it up? Is it all there? I guess I can't think of the tech. I have to think about having the team of the right people. Yeah, I got, I got to get you to stop thinking about that, period. It's like, yeah, it's done. We're good. Don't worry about it at all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I still ask, like, is it done? Because I'm still focused on it, but I don't need to be. Right. And that's the thing. And Chris knows that every minute that I'm still focused on making sure that he's got the tech done in the background, I'm not focused on strategy. Can't and be I, in two places at once. Yeah. Mentally or any otherwise. And, you know, the question's always going to come in, so I'm just going to address it before it comes in. What's going on with these ridiculous job descriptions you've got to see? <laughs> That's I'm yeah, tell you right now. Right. Dang it. Never... You, you interjected on yourself. See, before she, I she, it. She, before... Mike, you have to let us ask. ask okay, what are, what are, what are you okay, guys okay, okay, okay. All right. We're going to do this. In a, in a, there's, a, there's a sequence to this, I promise. So there's a question that, <laughs> that, um, that came in that I want to put up. That will lead you into what you want to talk about. But I know you also okay. want to talk about this because I know yes. Alonzo told me that he wanted you to talk about this. Oh, okay. Uh, so anyway, we're going to get to this question that came in from the chat box. And then you answer this. Then you can talk about the job description thing. So can you yes. ask, I guess I want to know the difference in the architect associate and professionals. What do they do? I suppose your program gets us a professional, correct? So I'm going to rephrase this. Mike can talk about certifications. I know they're a huge importance to getting a career. Yeah. Like I've got to have this certification, but I don't have any clue what they are. <laughs> yeah. Or am I wrong? I know so many people have that. Now, Del Rabat, zero certifications, cloud security architect. Zero. I mean, uh, I've gotten more people with no cloud certifications called architect jobs. You've gotten more people to get paid to get these certifications after yeah. they've been hired. I have gotten I, a lot of people I, a job for Jeffrey, Delroy, uh, Coyote, uh, Daniel, not Daniel, Yvonne that was on here last week. Yeah. I mean, like just yep. so anyway. And Jeffrey, it, it, we got so hired as a cloud practitioner. Well, he got his new he, job. Yeah, they got, yeah, all of them. Yeah, because he's asking about the difference between the associate and the professional. Like, I'm going to point out, like, even certification trainers. Like, I, told, I, I, I was telling Mike about this earlier. Mike knows about it because Mike talked with him about it. Andrew Brown from Exam Pro. Great guy. <laughs> whose, whose entire livelihood is based on getting people certified. Uh, it made a public plea to AWS on LinkedIn to please change the name of the architect certifications because they are not architect certifications hmm. so uh, my my thing is that the names of these certifications are just they're just completely irrelevant like there was a and i know uh, i'm going on a rant now you guys <laughs> oh, oh, oh. i get i get going i get going they're just certifications they are literally just pieces of paper like i don't even do I have a piece of paper i got a piece of paper like, this is how much I care about it. Oh, it's not a piece of paper. It's a cat toy. It's a cat toy. Like, that's more important than a piece of paper. But um, like, there are people that you can pay to get the certification for you. There are, you just go out, Google. Yeah. Pay someone to take my AWS certification. Yeah. And you'll find it. Like, I've, I've got a link right now. If anybody wants it, I might not give it to you, but... I got it right now. I was talking about it the other day that it 
it devalues and makes these certifications worthless when you can yeah. literally pay somebody to take it for you. And if you don't pay somebody to take it for you, I could point you to 15 websites on the internet where you can buy a copy of the full exam. And basically anybody that's got a bunch of certifications, that's what they've done. And uh, all right, so let's talk about these certifications and the purpose they serve. And then yes. and then I've got to interject with an even da more dangerous one. That yeah, let's get into this. So, yeah. so King, yeah. we teach you how to work as a cloud architect. And of course we cover that mini AWS certified solution architect professional. And that's about three to 7% of what's needed for the job. But we teach you the job. Here's what either one of these certifications are, the Certified Solution Architect Associate and Professional. It's basically AWS training you on all the buzzwords and names of their product and how to configure the product. But guess what? No cloud engineer is using the manual front console like they teach you there. And cloud architects don't touch the tech. And when they work for AWS, they're not even allowed to. I'm sorry, the solution architects, they call them solution architects, other people call them cloud architects. But they're just so different. So the certification course, yes, we teach the Azure Solutions Architect Expert and the Certified Solution Architects Professional in our boot camp. But here's the thing. That's nothing. Honestly, I could teach that in three days. It's really nothing. Somebody with no background can pass in a week with the right practice tech. What we teach is you know, how to get hired. What's the difference between the associate and certificate and professional? A little more complexity in the way AWS writes their exam questions. In the Certified Solution Architect Associate, for the most part, they're written cleanly and easy to read. You do the Certified Solution Architect Professional. Maybe it's a little base, more challenging, but it's basic compared to real certifications. And I'll talk about what they were. You know, it's nothing. You know, Chris, I like to share this periodically so people understand why I think these certifications are nothing and why employers think these certifications are nothing. So I want to show you the only certification ever in today's modern world that it's actually enough for you to get hired just from this certification. And I gave you one. Rule. I gave you one rule, Mike. I gave you one rule. <laughs> one one he's, rule. You only he's had breaking one it. Rule. <laughs> he's breaking it. <laughs> okay, well I'm going to break it. So this <laughs> certification is the CCIE. It's about seventy-five thousand pages of reading to get through it. That's why people can get a network engineer job with this and this alone. <laughs> it was my intro to networking 25 years ago. Now we've got managed to get the whole AWS Certified Solution Architect Associate and Professional into a free ebook, which you can download in 500 pages or less. So that's how basic it really, really is. It's, it's super basic, it's super intro level. And I'll stop sharing my screen now. But you know, we teach how to be an architect, the difference between an associate and a professional it's about 200 pages of reading. And when it comes to building a career like a solution architect career, it's about 500 hours of training. So, so there's there's something, the, the reason I brought this up was not just about the certifications. If you look if you look at the way that this question is phrased, and, and, and Leo even just sent this to me, but I noticed it before he sent it to me. And I saw this on the boot camp earlier today. I could be wrong about King here, but I did see it on the boot camp. What do they do? They don't do it. Oh, they, I think like the confusion is that there's actually roles. No, of a, of a solutions architect professional. Like there, there, there is an associate solutions architect role. Yes. Which is a specific role at AWS. But, but as far as what a solution architect associate or a solution architect professional, these aren't roles. Um, that's that they they are literally just the names of certifications and so so there's there there's no there's no roles there's no responsibilities yeah, there's no way to explain what an associate or a professional does they're right. just different degrees of the same exam it, it, it's just the same exam one's a little more complicated but they're still so basic Right. Here's the thing. It's all about the name of a service and how to configure that service. And and honestly, too. architects will never do that in their career. Ah, King gets it. Yeah. Thank you so much. It. And quite honestly, the, the difference between um, the pro, uh, professional and the associate is that the professionals are like a paragraph or two long. It's just a longer explanation of what they're already saying in the associate. That That's, that's all it is. 
Alonzo explained it perfectly. Yeah. It's getting to know their stuff so you can be designed to hopefully recommend it because people like to recommend what they know. It's, it's indoctrination. Like <laughs> it's indoctrination <laughs> what these certifications yeah. are. And I recently had somebody that passed the certification from another cloud provider and network provider, and they're like, Mike, you're right. It's all about getting me to sell their stuff. There was no depth to these things. All right. So here, here's another one. This one I was not going to go with. Uh, I, this was not up when I first interjected and took over your show. But um, <laughs> it, it has now come in. I've got two back-to-back, so be patient. Do not jump on it. I know you're going to jump on it, but don't jump on it. <laughs> Purdue, Purdue says, I don't think one can be a good solution architect unless you do engineering stuff before you transition to an architect role. Oh, hold him back. Hold him back. Uh, Ty, Tyrone responded with the, he said air hostess versus the airline pilot, but I like the airline mechanic versus the airline pilot better. But he said, well, unless you work on relational database management, I don't know, RDBMs, how can you architect how can the architect recommend a solution for relational databases versus something else? Now that last part, that's a reasonable question. Like how, I think, I think we need to have that discussion. If I don't, if I don't play with it, if I don't tinker with it, if I don't actually do it, how, how am I supposed to solution? solution well, and, I, and I'm going to answer that in two ways. First, I'm going to say, if you're in an airplane and you're flying at a thousand eight hundred miles an hour and four out of four airlines uh, engines fail on that plane, you can have two pilots. One that spent half of their time as an airline mechanic and knew all about how the plane worked, how to fix it, and what, and half of their time as a pilot, or you could have somebody that was just the pilot their entire 40 year career. I'm telling you what, I want the pilot that's a real pilot versus somebody that's a half mechanic. Hmm. Now, here's the thing, Pradeep architects need to focus on the business. Every minute you're focused on the engineering or the tech, you're not focused on learning how to improve the customer's business. So that'll automatically, automatically make you a less good architect because your job as the architect is not the tech that's engineering it's how do i make the business better so i need somebody with an, an mba versus somebody with a master's engineering that doesn't make a business better at all now let's get to the second side of things Pradeep, i'm not crazy enough to think that i could ever design an end-to-end -end cloud solution with 25 years experience if i did it would be a disaster and here's the reason why a really good cloud architect like me and i've been doing this for decades and by the way, AWS hires people with no background. JP Morgan Chase hires people with no background. I can tell you that Microsoft hires architect with no background. I can tell you that Accenture, Bearing Point, Deloitte all hire architects with background with no background. US Bank hires them without any background. And here's the reason. They know the architecture career is actually digital transformation, not hands-on tech. So how does an architect, a real architect, do it? Well, I go meet with a client and I get those business requirements. And because I'm especially trained in digital transformation and business, I know how to get the stuff out of the customer that they would never tell someone who was focused on the tech. Because I've spent half of my life focusing on communication and eliciting information. Now, when I go back to my organization, I'm not going to architect a database. Are you kidding me? I'm going to build a team. Because I'm uh, and well, because that's not, what I'm not, gonna... not unless you're the database architect. Yeah, if I was the database architect, I would do it. But I'm going to build a team. A cloud architect's a general position. I'm going to find some cloud network architects, some cloud security architects, some cloud IAM architects, some cloud big data architects. I am going to get a no SQL specialist like my friend Praveen, who spent about six years doing nothing other than Mongo database, and he's expert at it. I'm going to get some people. I'm going to contact Oracle and their database architects. I'm going to contact Microsoft. I'm going to hire some other professional architects that do nothing in their life other than designing databases. I'm then going to hire some big data specialists, and I'm going to hire some, and I'm going to get some DevOps engineers to talk about the implementation and some SysOps people to talk about how they're going to maintain it after it's done. And that's why architects are not engineers, because you've got two options. Let's say I focused my 25 years on tech, and I'm one of the original Cisco certified internet experts, and I design half of the world's ISPs. But let's say I focused and thought I could know it all. I can't. And when you focus on knowing it all, guess what you are? A jack of all trades and a master of none. So me, I'm going to build an expert team. I could pretend that after 25 years I could do it all, but that would be insanity and I'd be a disaster. Or I could build a team of 30 people who each have 10 to 15 years experience in their domain. So instead of me worrying about being a jack of all trades, 
I've got an expert team with 450 years experience. Now, when I go back to a customer with my billion dollar architecture that's going to transform their business, do they care that I was an engineer and really good at it? Or do they care that I brought a team of experts from around the world to go design my customers the best solution? You got a choice, Pradeep. You can be an engineer, and that's great. And if you love engineering, I strongly recommend you do it. It's a wonderful career. But if you love architecture, realize it's no longer about the tech. The customer doesn't care about the tech. It's about how do you improve that customer's business. So that's what we do. And that's why AWS hires our students directly. Whether they were waiters, why, why they're hiring people that were selling landscaping gear, mental health tech, because these people are trained on how to design. I don't care if my architect knows all about RDSs. I hope they don't. I hope they can be focused on being the good leadership skills to get somebody with the right background to do these things. I need my architects to know why they want to use a relational database, what are kind of relationships between variables, how can that be used to impact business performance. I want my customers to know what the capabilities are of a new SQL database, whether I need flexible schema, whether I need to store game state, a large volume of financial things. I need to know when and then who the right people are to bring in. Because architecture is like that, my favorite African proverb. If you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. Architecture is a team sport in every sense of the way. No one man, no woman ever designs an architecture unless it's insignificant. Yeah, I think there's a, I think there's something to be said about the, the awareness of these things and how they, what, what their importance are and what they, you know, what they, what they can do, what they, what they need, versus actually doing them and implementing them. Just like, just like you know, you know how to drive a car. You know what type of gas to put in your car. You know what, well, I was about to say, you know what type of oil to put in your car, but I'm sure a lot of people don't know nowadays. But you know how to check your oil. You know how to read the engine lights. You know how to read the odometer and the speedometer and the gas gauge. You know how to do all these things, but you don't know how to fix any of it. Right. I mean, some of you might, but, you know, unless you're a mechanic, you, you, you don't. Yeah, that's the understanding of the car yeah. or be a mechanic to design the car. Exactly. Yeah. Um, even if you were a mechanic, it wouldn't teach you how to design a car. Right. Exactly. That's what I was about to say. Uh, if you're an engineer, different story. If you're a mechanical engineer, then you probably know how to design a car. But, exactly. <laughs> but if you're but so I've got one more question, Alonzo, and then I'm gonna let you get back to some of yours. These are just I've been watching the questions that come in and they 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 really I see the dangerous ones and I, that I want to make sure we address for people and get, make sure we save some people some time. And the worst part of it is, I want to just add the last comment here. I see it all the time. We see engineers that become architects and they want to hung, hold on to their engineering so much. And while their other architects are earning two and three hundred thousand dollars more per year, they're stuck because their hiring managers want the business person, not the techie. Mm -hmm. I wish it wasn't the case. People should get compensated more for their tech, but it's not. It's about the value and the impact and the revenue you can bring in and impact. No. So I've got two questions back to back, but it's about the same thing that I want you to talk about. So Alex says, unfortunately, I've been getting cloud architect and solution architect positions that require engineering skills. I think some employees, employers are either confused or trying to get away with combining jobs. Um, and then follow up to that from TM. Some job postings seem to conflate these two things, engineer and architect. Any suggestions for really dialing in on just the solution architect possibilities? So I know you got a lot to say about job postings. Yeah. And I'm going to start wanna, it out. I want to say two things. Alex is probably 100% correct on both things that he just said. Yeah, so especially true. right now. Especially and right I now. I have some experience on that why too as well. So we, we can share a bit of that and see what you think, Mike. So we, we got confused employers and you also have some companies that will be trying to get away with a jack of all trades that can do everything so that they don't have to have the ballooned budget or what they perceive to be a ballooned budget. Um, yeah, so Alex, it's two things. One is organizations always have a wish list on their job description. I've never been has more than 10% of the skills on a wish list. I've also only interviewed with five companies and I got interviewed, hired by all five of them. So there is that. Now, you know, when we speak to employers and we speak to them 
quite a lot. I'm not sure if you've gotten any interviews yet, Alex, or, or if you're actually just getting recruiters that are reaching out to you. The big companies, the real ones, Accenture, Deloitte, Bearing Point, Capgemini, the big banks and the cloud providers and the big tech companies all don't combine these positions. And none of them do. Small businesses, though, by comparison, do. And they're not really architect roles at all. They're really engineering roles. But this is typically your small company, big retailer, they're separate, global bank, they're separate, small to mid-sized businesses, they're there. And there's a couple things going on in economically wise, but let me start, tell, start telling about what employers tell us. Employers tell us they don't want a techie. In fact, one guy, uh, somebody from AWS came, who was a director at AWS, came to talk to our class and says, look, I love the way you guys teach it because we need C-level executives, soft skills, this, this, this. But that's a cloud provider. They know what they need. It's Cisco. They were there. Now, when Chris and I spoke with some C-level executives recently, and I speak to them all the time, they told us, we don't want a techie. We're not concerned so much about their technical background, but their ability to communicate it, get the requirements, build a relationship, and sell it. In fact, it got so bad with these ridiculous job descriptions because nobody knew what an architect was. And the point is, organizations have known what architects were for the last 20 years. But these vendors came up with these silly names. They called their certification solutions architect. And it made somebody that's never worked in tech confused. Now, if you ask chief information officers what do you want in a cloud architect, and this is published in CL Magazine, here's what they're going to tell you. I want someone that can lead the cultural change for cloud adoption. Someone that can develop and coordinate a cloud architecture. Someone that can develop a cloud strategy and coordinate the adoption process. Someone that can find talent with the necessary skills. Someone that can assess application software and hardware. Someone can, that can create a cloud broker team. Someone that can establish best practices for the cloud across the company. Someone that can help select cloud providers and vet third party services. Someone that can oversee governance and mitigate risk working closely with the IT security people to monitor privacy and develop incident response procedures, manage budgets and estimate costs and operate at scale. Now, Alex, I have a feeling that we need to retune your resume a little bit. I know what went into your resume. I think when we tried to show you your tech background, we put a little too much coding in it. And I'm sure that's driving recruiters to ask you more about these things. So there's that plus. You know, economically, right now, it, organizations are going to look to not hire cloud engineers, potentially lay off cloud engineers in a recession. And they're, they're going to be seeing, you know, can the cloud architect do the cloud engineering? Because if they can, you know, they're not going to be good as an architect, but they'll wither the recession a little better. And if they can't, they'll still do the architecture stuff and they'll outsource these cloud engineering jobs to much lower cost regions, part, parts of the world where you can get some very highly intelligent, incredibly capable cloud engineers, because there's a lot of them spread throughout the world. And one of the things that I've seen in historical perspective, Mike, is when I, in my other life in the marketing industry, when the uh, economic upheaval was over on the horizon, what a lot of companies were trying to do was create this amalgamation of different roles for one person for a discounted rate. So they wanted everybody, they wanted to reverse what we were talking about exactly. to fit their needs by having this jack of all trades for little to nothing. Yeah, because if a jack of all trades, you don't have to pay them anything. Right. You know, my people get paid a lot because they're executives. But, you know, look at these video games that are coming out there, how to learn cloud. They're just trying to lower the staff for the basic cloud admin work to nothing. It'll be no different than somebody working at a retail store or a phone company that when you want a phone number set up, you call them, they're like, okay. And it does an automatic provisioning system. So let's talk, I'm going to give it back to Alonzo here in just a second. So let's talk about that jack of all that trades thing. The, um, that jack of all trades phrase, you know, if you know the whole thing, it talks about how being a jack of all trades is actually a good thing. That made sense in the 1600s. Yes. In Europe, mm -hmm. where that originated from, because it was very hard to find work. That was not. <laughs> that it was very hard to find specialty work. Um, it doesn't make sense now, because it is very easy to find specialty work. So 
that's why nobody utilizes that full saying anymore unless they actually know the, the history behind the saying. So it made sense 400 years ago to be a jack of all trades because any work was better than no work. Yeah. Now it's very easy to get a specialized career if, you de if you're dedicated and focused and specializing. So and why, I just wanted to throw about, that do it. And let's talk about why the specialty matters so much more versus the jack of all trades diversify your skill set, which was good 2,200 years ago, but not today. What's going on right now is, you know, we're in a tight labor market and in a recession, and we're in a tight labor market because employee productivity has gone down, which is, and there's inflation causing wage pressure. So you can see it every day. I no longer have trash men and women that come to my house. I've got a person that drives the machine. The machine lifts the trash into the truck. Used to be three people's jobs, and it's now, now none. Now one person to drive. I won't, I won't shop there, but Amazon made cash stores with nobody working there. No cashiers. Why? Because they didn't want to deal with the employees. Now that, poof, is an example of what's going on. I went to the local restaurant and they said, look, we haven't been able to get anybody that's willing to work. So we're resorting to Rosie the robot. And what's going on is this stuff is making it the jack of all trades just aren't good enough for the main jobs where we need a specific skill set. It's great if you're in the wilderness and these jobs were once very good. But now we're approaching a world where we need people that can master the technology to drive that transformation. Now, years ago, it was more important for the jack of all trades. When I started working in tech, you know, none of the stuff worked. And the network engineer that could also write a Linux script to try and figure out what, how to parse syslog files and figure out what was going on was a valuable skill set. But here's the thing. I worked with those engineers. I trained to focus on routing and switching. They focused on everything. And I was earning double what they did with half the experience because employers even then wanted it. So right now with the way the world is changing, you really need to be the leader or else get stuck and sucked behind. And that's where I'm really, really, really there. So let's go back to you, Alonzo. Okay. And I'm taking a lot of what you're saying into account and when it comes to cloud architecture and cloud engineering roles, a lot of people are asking us what they should do versus what is of interest to you? What speaks to you? What can complement your existing background? And overall, what do you see your future becoming? And what do we always tell them constantly based on what their questions are? Yeah, my question is, every day people are obsessed with telling me their past. People want to book up a private session with me, which takes eight weeks and it's $500 to tell me about their past. And here's the thing, your past has nothing to do with your future. What I ate for dinner yesterday does not affect what I eat today versus tomorrow. It's just the past. Now, if I wanted to write an autobiography, yeah, your past is there. Now, I did have a case of a student that got a great cloud architect offer but didn't pass the background check. So there are times where if someone's got a criminal background, for example, poof, that can affect your future. But outside of being a murderer or having felony convictions on your resume, and if you're in California, they can't even check your, your background anyway. So let's go, beyond, let's go beyond that. What employer cares about is not what you did yesterday. They care about what can you do for me today? And your past does not define your future. I used to practice internal medicine. I was a nurse practitioner. Well, that's what I love. One day I said, I want to be a network engineer. And you know what everybody told me? Mike, you got to be a help desk. You got to do this nonsense. You got to be after a help desk. You can be a network admin. And then five years later, you can be a network engineer. The job I applied for went in 10 years of experience. I had zero. I went on the interview and they said, I know you applied to be a network engineer, but we're going to make you a senior network engineer. And I looked at them like I had four heads. And they said, look, you know more than two-thirds of our people, and you've never even worked here yet. So we're moving you here. I took Delroy Bat, who was taking people back and forth to the hospital, and he's now working for CDW as a cloud security architect. We took Daniel Boso, love the kid. He'll tell you he didn't graduate high school. He was working at Nordstrom, you know, selling shoes. And poof, now he's at J.P. Morgan Chase. I can tell you about Jennifer, who came to us as a mental health tech, and 
instantly, within six months to a year, she's now working at J.P. Morgan Chase. I can tell you about Ivan Tema that was serving food at a restaurant that's now working at AWS, or Coyote, the college student, or Jeffrey, the geologist that did geospatial imaging that's now working at Callion. And the point is, is it's what you can do for me now, not what you did in your life. So your past is interesting. There's always really good lessons from the past that we can bring into our past life. But, you know, think about it this way. If somebody else in their past life was in sales, and I want to make them an architect where they design percent and sell, that's very valuable experience. Incredibly. If that person has been programming Java for the last 10 years, that's not really related to designing, presenting, and selling solutions. So in one case, you know, it's easier for me to get to a mental health tech job than a software engineer. By comparison, when someone has a networking background or a data center background like Joe Millen, Joe Millen came to me as a CCIE network engineer. He was with us for three weeks before he got hired as an AWS senior solution architect because in his case, the experience was relevant. But the point is your past does not define your future. The workout you did three days from now, unless you got injured, will not affect your workout tomorrow. And, you know, don't let anything hold you back. We all have dreams. I've done it. I've changed careers. I've helped countless people do it. And you can do it too. What matters is how hard you're willing to work. Why, how, what your plan is. Are you learning the right things? And do you have the complete optimal skill set that employers desire? And you have the attributes that employers desire. Well, I got another one for you as well, Mike. Okay. And when it comes to, we spoke a lot about being in the in the boardroom. Spoke, spoke a lot about the sensitivity required, the uh, immediacy of you getting that information to the business leader right then, right now. How you need to communicate to them, and on that communication uh, thread. Could you tell me? Could you tell everyone in the audience why acronyms will totally fail you and flunk you out of that meeting? Well, if you use acronyms in front of a, a meeting with an executive, you'll be escorted out by security. Executives don't think in acronyms; they don't know what acronyms are, and they generally don't even know what the technology names are. They care about can this product do the job? Can this product make my business better? But executives and anybody in high-level architecture positions, medical positions, know that, that acronyms cause errors. I'll give you two examples. Example one, I used to practice internal medicine. Then I was a network engineer before I was an architect. I was an architect six months later. And somebody called me in the middle of the night from the knock and said, Mike, the systems are down. We're having all kinds of problems with the PVC. And I said, give a lidocaine bolus. What's their weight in milligrams per kilograms? Then start a lidocaine drip at this. And they said, what are you talking about? I said, you're telling me about the premature ventricular contractions. We don't want them to go into VTAC. And he's like, no, I'm talking about frame relay permanent virtual circuit. But that's the point. Nobody knows what these acronyms mean. Acronyms look like sloppy language to an executive. Mm -hmm. Sloppy language they're not interested in. And, our, and people know that when you're talking in, in acronyms, you're going to be making errors. They yeah. care about your communication skills. And let's face it. Doctors used to do it. They used to put down MS as a diagnosis. And, and when, they, when people thought it was morphine sulfate, they'd give morphine sulfate. A patient would overdose and die. So in medicine, they're not, we aren't even allowed to use acronyms. And pretty much in, in, as an architect, it's kind of like the swear jar you have in your house. You put 20 <laughs> bucks in it every time you use an acronym in a meeting. I'm not joking, but that's really what it's like. Yeah, I, I, got, I got a good question for you on that one. Abigail decided to ask... Uh... What are the thoughts on TAM roles? So I responded, what do you mean by TAM roles? <laughs> that's exactly the answer. Because TAM is different in 10 different companies. I'm thinking tactical application management, but you know, right. so TAM means to total addressable market right. in the business environment. But it can see that's the problem. It can meet these things. So, you know, that, that the technical account manager role is kind of an entry level role. It's really a sales role. And what it really is like is you've got this sales rep that's not, that's kind of a hybrid sales rep. They're less of an executive than the kind of people I'm talking about, like a real account manager. And they also know a little of the tech. So you took, mix that technical account manager 
as kind of like a sales specialist and you kind of mix that with like a junior or a mid-level solution architect. And then in time to that, you've got an account executive that's doing all the high level stuff. I think it's a nice intro level sales job. I think it's great for that. I think it pays well. And I'm like, oh, I think you could like it. I really do. It's a good job. What about, and I, and I think. Yeah. Hold on, I got, yeah. a okay. I got another follow up to that. I got two, okay. two good follow ups to that. They're perfectly appropriate. Um, where did it go? 658, 658, 658. There we go. All right. Sorry. I'm trying to piggyback these on there because everybody's kind of like thinking alike. So, so Wes asked if someone who takes your architect course and gets hired by, oh, never mind. That's not it. That's not it. That's not the question. Here it is. Wes asked, does your architect course teach me how to talk to CXOs? Does the first question to the CEO have to be the best one? Well, Wes, of course we teach you how to, to, to speak to CXOs. You're unhirable if you don't. And, of course, we teach that because that's why we get our students hired. Now, here's the thing. A CEO has a one-tenth of one-second attention span. If he can't capture them within the first tenth of a second, the meeting's over, and you didn't even realize it. So, you know, kind of keep that in the back of your mind. Now, CXO, the reason I use that and I hate using it is because the business community has used the term CXO and that realistically means chief executive officer versus chief information officer versus chief technology officer versus chief financial officer where the X is whatever variable you want to put in place. All right, that's all my piggyback questions, Alonzo. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, okay. they were appropriate. You were talking about communication. Yeah, I, I think it, it's really good. And, and I'm going to swing it back to relevancy, competency, because I've seen and, you know, as a preamble and disclaimer, you know, about how AWS, they'll give you a career path or a career a certification pathway, if you will. You start off with the practitioner then the associate uh, architect, then the professional architect, then you go on to uh, SysEd, DevOps, then more specialty networking. Could you explain why that pathway will delay your career path as well as incur additional costs versus you learning the competency of the agnostic cloud? Okay, so it's going to be a couple of things. First, when you're busy learning three people's career, you're not learning your career. So right then and there, I'm going to tell you, I won't even interview anybody with more than four certifications. And many of the hiring managers I speak to will not interview anybody unless they've got, if they've got more than a couple of certifications because they want the person that's focused on being an architect, that digital transformation specialist, as opposed to being a certification junkie. Now, the next side of it is every minute you're not learning your job, your smart competition is learning their job. And who am I going to hire as a cloud architect? Someone that can truly be a massively good cloud architect or someone that doesn't know what an architect is. They don't know what sysops is. They don't know what DevOps is because the reality is in the certification, you may have 2% of the skills necessary for the job. And at a professional level, maybe 5%. So nobody's going to hire you on certification alone. I hear from hiring managers every day. They don't care. They care, can you do the job? Now, the next problem is the opportunity cost of your time. The average cloud architect earns $600 a day. Look, I've got cloud architect graduates that are earning $285 a year, too. And that's about $1,200 a day. So here's the thing, or $1,000 a day, something like that. No, it's about $1,200. It's about $1,200. So the point is, is if you spend nine months learning other people's job, not only will you not get your job, but you spent nine months where you could have been earning $12,000 per month. So just think about that. There you're basically losing $100,000 or more right there by wasting your time learning other people's certifications. Now, the certification providers love it. And I'm going to pretty much tell you, if somebody has a certification bundle, run away. And the reason is they just want to sell you stuff. When students would say to me, Mike, can I buy your cloud architect and cloud engineer? I'd say no. I'd say buy the one for the career you desire. Being good at somebody else's job is not good for you. You've all heard me say it on constantly. I don't want to sell you all my stuff. 
wait, the CEO doesn't want to sell you all my stuff? No, I only want to sell people things that are going to change their lives and get them a career. So we won't even sell our own stuff. That's why I said anybody who's got a certification bundle, run their way. Run, they're, kind of, they're not quite a criminal, but they're, they're out to get you and your money, and they don't care about you. So run or run away from these things. But the key is there's just so much to be lost when you waste your time with certification. Here's the worst part. The worst part is by training your soft skills and your emotional intelligence, the average person gets a 30,000, 30% plus raise in salary. So you can be dealing with 60 to $100,000 of salary bump just by training soft skills. So what are you going to train? The things that get you another six figures a year or the stuff that nobody cares about having another piece of paper certification. And at the end of the day, you know what you can do with that certification? When your heater's broken, you can use it to heat your house by burning it. But <laughs> you can't cash a certification at the bank. Nobody cares. Uh, that okay. leads me to my favorite comparison. You know, people ask people ask about, uh, you know, if they get a certification at the end of our end of our training. And I tell them, you know, that certification that you're going to get at the end of the training usually comes from a at Microsoft.com email account and includes multiple pages explaining what your compensation package is going to be. That's mm. going to be your certification at the end of the end of the training. Right. And you and you actually you make a good point and, and I know Alonzo was talking about said something about this the other day, you know, uh, banks won't banks won't honor a certificate but they'll honor a job offer. Yes. And it got me thinking it's like you're right. I I've, yeah. I've actually used a signed job offer Mm -hmm. as verification of income to finance a house finance a house get an yep. apartment do whatever because what do you think they're going to say when you have and i think we had a, a infographic about that months ago where you have this it's like trading baseball cards and and please understand i'm not demeaning anyone who has had yep. a ton of, of certifications however we gotta give you some tough love here and and express that that pathway uh, uh, less is more because you're, comp you're you're compounding your competency in communicating that to the hiring manager and you're supplementing, not complementing, or rather you're complementing, not supplementing your knowledge. And you know if you go to the bank, well, I've got all these certifications. You know they are not going to care. <laughs> they yeah. they want to know. What are you bringing in? Just like any business leader, it's like, how is this going to transform my business? How am I going to make money, save money, create uh, business opportunities, uh, continue relationships based on what you can bring to the table and how you communicate to our existing vendors, servers, people that we're trying to get, people that we have partnerships, the, uh, the potential of losing these partnerships and our reputation if we don't uphold our side of, of the bargain um, with these partnerships and so forth. It's all about what you're bringing to the table and your competency. And, and you know, I just wanted to, to share that. So, you know, it's just there, important. And then let's talk about yeah, the interview another. aspect of what the, where multiple certifications hurt you too. Yeah. So here's what happens. Sometimes I have a student, a long time ago I had a student, and he kept asking me, Mike, I keep getting asked engineering questions on his interview. He was a really smart guy. I think he went to IIT. He was a brilliant, brilliant guy. Yeah. And I looked, and he's all this DevOps certifications and SysOps and all this techie stuff on his resume. And he's like, Mike, I just can't pass an interview. And I said, here's what we're going to do. I said, in class, can I take over your resume? And I said, yes. I took off all those certifications where he was not an expert. We then changed his resume. Three weeks, four weeks later, he had three job offers. And two things that happened. One is we built his brand so employers could see who he was. But two, expect anything on your resume to be questioned about. And you can be, it could take you a lifetime to be a really rock solid DevOps engineer, a lifetime to be an incredible cloud architect, and a lifetime to be a network architect, a lifetime to be a big data architect and really do this. And what happens is when you need to pass the interview, they need to know that you can do your job. And the more stuff that's on there, the more they're going to check your background. And here's what they're going to find out if your only background is certification. You don't know anything. Because certifications are superficial. True. About how to do stuff, not how it works. And instantly the job offers go away. 
So there's a question that just came in that I want to I want to talk about. I'm going to talk about it for a minute, and then I want Mike to talk about it because there's two different there's two different perspectives to this question, and I have one perspective from my experience, and Mike has another perspective from his experience. And we're going to talk from the perspective of the employer that writes the job description. So Pradeep says, if certification doesn't matter, why does pretty much every job description refer to some sort of cert certificate? Nice to have. So the thing to know about job descriptions, they are used by HR, human resources. HR doesn't know anything about the role. They don't know anything about the, the job. They don't know anything about the department. The only thing that they know about is HR and human resources and hiring and retention and compensation and best practices for implementing a great culture in your business and so on and so forth which that's what they should know about i, I speak from this from previous experience as a uh, hr manager at a uh, at a 600 employee company well 6,000 employee company 600 at the location that i worked at so hr doesn't know anything about the roles when it comes down to job descriptions, the only way that we can we can uh, conceivably determine if any of the thousands of applications for this one position are reasonably qualified is by implementing arbitrary metrics, such as they have to have this certification or must have this amount of experience. Again, none of the, the I and any HR person is not going to, going to be able to make a judgment on anything other than metrics, and they are poor. They are poor measurements of competency. They are used in place of measuring competency. Mm -hmm. The assumption from HR is that. X number of years of experience or X certification implies a level of competency. As I said previously, you can pay people to get a certification for you. That you're clearly not, if you do that, you clearly, and you haven't actually learned any of the, uh, of, of the, the knowledge, then you, you're, you don't have the competency that that certification implies. But you know, you might have it, you might not, but there's no guarantee that a certification or a or a number of years of experience correlates to competency. But it is our only way in human resources to do any type of of measuring, determining this person or this person, this person or this person, this person or this person, because. We, in speaking from my experience at a, I was a HR manager at a casino. So we had people all the way from high level executives that ran the entire property to people that were working the, 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 the cocktail servers, the um, restaurant servers, the front desk agents at the, at the, at the hotel, the cage attendants and the, the money cage the security officers, the secure, the sergeants, the investigators, everybody. Um, even for the $12 an hour position, we would get thousands of applications. So, you know, the higher up the position went, it got a little less, but still, even for manager and supervisor positions, we would get hundreds of applications. And there's simply no way other than putting these arbitrary metrics in place. Now, who comes up with these arbitrary metrics? Not me, not the HR person, because I don't have any idea what the certification is. <laughs> I don't, if it were up to me, and I guarantee you guys have seen it, if it's up to me, I'm going to say I want 25 years of Kubernetes experience because it sounds great. And we've seen that on job. And we've seen that. I know some of even you though, have seen it. Even though it but doesn't it, exist it, that long. It doesn't make sense. So that's one that's made up by HR. Yeah. But the majority of them are made up by hiring managers and given to HR. But do you think that hiring manager actually spends the time to write the 3,000-word job description? No way. 
So Mike, what's your experience on writing a job description? So here's how I write a job description, Pradeep. I'm not a job description writer. I've got to manage my team and make sure I go to ZipRecruiter, Dice, Indeed. I look for the first thing that looks like mine, and I say, wow, none of the things I care about is in there. So cut, cut and paste it all into Microsoft Word, add my stuff, put it back there, and it's done. Now, that's the key. Now, I'm going to tell you right now, Delroy Bat gets messages every single day, and he has no cloud search whatsoever. Hmm. He's got a really good cloud, cloud architect job, a cloud security architect with no search. And I've got so many people getting hired without search because they're competent. And, you know, and I'm going to get back to the job description in, in a second, but specialty position, zero experience in tech, zero search, and he's still working because he's competent. So the way I write a job description is as follows. Add my three lines of stuff. And this is not just Mike. This is every. This is every, every everybody that this I know. This is the that chef in the restaurant. This is yeah. the the bar manager. This is everybody. And in the end, we get a wish list, which includes three Olympic gold medals, four thousand years experience, certification, and, and things that aren't even related to the job. And I'm going to tell you, here's exactly what happens, Brigitte. These people pass through HR because of the scanner. Now our students don't apply to HR. Our students recruiters bombard them and hire them, but because you know. We know how to make the people come to you, so we don't have to deal with putting silly stuff on your resume. So then there's that. So then the case is these people get to us as the hiring manager. And now here's what it's like. Can you do this? Blah, 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 blah. Not an answer. How about this? Blah, 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 blah. How about this? All right, you're out of here. Now, the reality is after interviewing, and I've interviewed 5,000 people before I started to this company, I was able to hire less than 50 of them because less than 50 were competent. And I've hired less than 50 in my life. And believe it or not, 25% of them had zero experience or even knowledge. And I figured I was going to train them because I liked them that much because that's how hard it is to find somebody that's actually good. So here's what we do as hiring managers. We go through this HR nonsense for a little while. We don't get anybody that we need. Now, obviously, if you wrote our own job descriptions, we probably wouldn't have this problem, but we're too lazy to do that and too busy. So then I go call Christina Marino from IT Excel in New York. Christina Marino is one of my favorite recruiters. And I say, Christina, I need the best cloud architect you know, someone with business acumen, strong design skills, leadership skills, executive presence, emotional intelligence, big network and data center background. So Christina calls me back 24 hours later and says, I've got this chow found for you, Mike. She's smart as a whip. She can do this, 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 and this. And she, I think you're going to like her. Now, I then interviewed Chow. I hire her because she's the world's greatest. And she did hire her. And then Chow, I tell HR, I'm hiring Chow put one, at 1 1.3 times the average salary of the cloud architect because of her excellent attitude, executive presence. I then tell Chow, look, now you got to go fill out an application for the job. And then poof, Chow's hired. She's promoted a year later to senior architect. And a year later, she gets an utter rejection from HR. Doesn't matter. She's promoted. In fact, I've interviewed with eight companies. I've gotten offers for all eight but I literally got hired from every job interview I've ever been on. And you know, the reality is this, the three where I turned them down were all related to weird interviews that gave me a weird experience. So every job discussion is a wish list, And I've never, ever, ever had more than 10% of things. And while we encourage certifications, we even have a certification formula and we can teach it in our program. We're telling you right now, certifications will never get you a job. But they help, will help you get an interview. But if you do the right branding, you'll get an interview anyway. Our students do. They don't need, they don't need to apply for jobs. Yep. And, you know, another thing, even if you, uh, obviously, at some of these larger organizations like Microsoft or J.P. Morgan Chase, they're going to have very formulaic job descriptions. Um, but they still have a lot of stuff that isn't relevant. Right. Um, the, so something to keep in mind is that the job description has to be stuffed with anything and everything that could possibly capture what they're looking for. And, and also, if an experienced person is going for that role, they'll point out that a lot of stuff that they need is a contradiction to yeah. what's expected. For I, that I was I, I was a recruiter before I realized it. I, when I was an HR manager, I actually took the time to call the department heads and say, okay, what are we literally looking for here? Mm -hmm. And uh, 
And I didn't realize that that's what a recruiter did, but until later, until years later, but I wonder, I was wondering why they liked me so much, but it's because I, t I took the time to, to be like, okay, what, what are we really looking for here? Because I knew the job description just was like all over the place. Um, and I didn't do that for, for the, you know, the hourly positions because that different story. But when I was dealing with supervisor roles or, or manager roles or, uh, coordinator roles. I, I would call the department heads and say, "All right, well, what is what do you really want after the out of the, these thirty thousand words?" Um, so let's um, let's go to um, got a lot of questions that have come in. I want to make sure we get to as many of them as we can. Yeah. So Alonzo, if you'll uh, take this one, read it off for Mike. We'll okay, just... it's from from Sai Krishna. I am a VM engineer. How can I accelerate my career in cloud technologies? Well, here's the thing. If you are a VMware engineer, you're already working in cloud technology. So the question is, what do you want to do? Do you want to be a solution architect? Do you want to be a cloud architect? Do you want to be a DevOps engineer? Because right now as a VMware EX, VMware engineer, you're already building clouds. The hyper-converged data centers of 20 years ago are no different than today's modern clouds, other than using the, using the VMware hypervisor. They're using their own hypervisors and their own control plane management software. So you're already 10 times more advanced than if you just took the certified solution architect professional. Now, the real question is, what do you want to be? You tell us what you want to be, and then we can tell you whether you need training or not need training and how to get there. Good question. I can take another one, Chris, if you'd like. From David, is it safe to say a sales engineer is no. the same as a cloud solutions architect? We see this in JD's use interchangeably, but some feedback in the boot camp today sounds slightly otherwise. They're similar, David, but not the difference. And I've been both. Now, here's what a sales engineer does. They design, present, and sell to the technologists. And because of that, you know, the sales engineers are moderately paid, but not overly well paid. Now, the solutions architect or the cloud architect has much better leadership skills, much better sales skills, much better executive presence and communication skills. And they're more of an executive. And that's why your solution architect can earn double or more what a sales engineer would run. So the job function is very similar. As, the, as an enterprise architect like me, I'm talking to the CEO and I'm gonna go help close a billion dollar deal. As the sales engineer, they're gonna be ones doing the back end design and the enterprise architect, cloud architect like me is gonna go parachute in. I'm gonna lead a team of sales engineers and other engineers to do the design together. The sales engineers will help respond to the RFIs, RFPs and RFQs, but the architect is a much higher role in terms of pay and in terms of respect as a general rule. But similar. Great question, dude. Excellent question. Because they're very similar. I lost my place. Give me a second. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, here we go. Pretty good question here. You can't know every business is cloud architect. How do you make the decisions on what that business needs? Oh, well, that's why you need so much business acumen. And that's why there's two kinds of architects. As a, a cloud architect, you must know revenue and the tools that organizations can do to increase revenue. You also must know the tools that organizations can use to increase productivity. You need to know the business applications that are out there. How does unified communications help with collaboration? How do you optimize supply chain? See, that's your job. That's why it takes us 500 plus hours of training to teach these business things. And you need to go back and more and more. I'll tell you right now, don't waste any time on a cloud engineering certification or a master's in tech. If you want to be an architect, it's a waste of your time. Get an MBA and increase your business acumen. It'll increase your employability and your salary. So the key is you must learn business. And then the reality is you can be a specialist like me or a generalist in business. So your generalist is like a management consultant that would exist anywhere. They know business. Now, someone like me is I focused in the healthcare industry. Well, first I worked in the banking industry, and then I spent the bulk part of my career in my main architect role in healthcare. Why? Because I used to know how to practice medicine, and you know, as a nurse practitioner, before that I was a nurse, and I knew architecture. So I focused on that. 
So that's why you got to pick a specialty because you can't know everything about everything. But you must have some business fundamentals, how to read a financial statement, how to read a balance sheet, how to what are the revenue inputs, what's related to employee productivity, what's going on with the supply and demand curves, what's going on with the money supply, all that's going to affect, what's going on with taxes, all that affects the business. And it's your job to understand that and have that business acumen to be able to advise businesses. So yeah, most of the focus is on this. And that's why I say you can't be focused on engineering. Because if you're focused on engineering, you're not able to do this. You know that that Mike, that actually makes me think about something that I that I heard. Um, I, I am muted. Jeez, I'm over here. I'm over here like rattle it off. You weren't muted. We were listening to you. Oh, we heard you. It said I was muted. Huh? Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Perfect. So you know you know I like to watch CNBC. I do. And do. So. There was someone on, I guess it was last week, whenever the interest rates went up again, um, I guess that, or no, 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 yeah. Yeah, it was a couple of weeks ago. But there was a, someone on there that made a very valid point, and I hear you talk about this all the time. Weighted cost of capital or the cost of doing business. And there was a very valid point that blew my mind and I'm pretty sure Alonzo falls into this category with me. The person said that if there's people that are under the age of 45 that are in positions where they have to know how to finance their, their business operations, they have to know how much it costs to do business, where they've never dealt with it actually costing money to get money. And this whole interest rate, all the, the, the these raising interest rates are completely changing because it's been 15 or 20 years since it's actually cost money for companies to get money at the at the weight that they are now. And it just made me think about the amount of business skills that it takes. And, it, and when they said that, I'm like, even people 45, they don't. And his point was that they have to go find people that are older than them. <laughs> to tell them how, like he's like they're gonna have to go find the people that have experienced this that worked in the 80s and the 90s in these in the roles that they're in now and how and, and get them to mentor them to guide them through how to navigate business in these situations in, in this environment and i was like wow people that are 40 like that's think about working age 18 to 45 that's that's 27 years worth of life experience <laughs> that is not going to be helpful in this environment, this, this uh, okay. financial environment. But, wow. but here's where it matters. Like in your certification, they say there's a cost shift from capital to operational. And then you see everybody that gets certified posting on the internet. Isn't it the greatest thing? You shift from uh, capital expenditures to operational expenditures. But here's the thing. You got to look at the weighted average cost of capital. Mm -hmm. I'm going to tell you right now, that it cost me $11,000 to build our OpenStack cloud that we teach our students with. I will also tell you the main cloud providers wanted $10,000 a month. So realistically speaking, over the course of three years, one would have costed me $360,000, one would cost me eleven. dollars Now, if my borrowing costs were at 2%, and if I finance it instead of paying cash, what would I have been paying? Maybe 100 bucks a month versus 10000 bucks a month in the cloud. So we need to understand the organization's borrowing costs. How they get their money is it via stock shares is their weighted average cost of capital what the loans are how their capital is structured and then from there we can look at the business cases as an architect where does it make sense to put the technology mm -hmm. how is the technology used why do we need to put some stuff in our data center other stuff in the cloud and that's why you can't do this job with regards to this and that's why when people are so focused on engineering they don't have the skill to do this because their training's focused on somebody else's job and yeah. that's why it's so critical to know your job. Well, I've loved cloud engineers, and cloud engineers should get the deepest cloud engineering training in the world. But it got a, for a cloud architect getting cloud engineering training, like it's like a doctor going to law school to learn how to be a doctor. Yeah. It's just a different job, and it doesn't make you good at it. Yeah, I mean, because if you just think about it, just in the simple terms of borrowing money and the interest rates to borrow the money, the percentage rates to borrow, to, to borrow money have almost tripled. And, and they're the still some of the cheapest they've been in history. 
Well, I know, but I'm just, I'm just saying like they, but they tripled where it was where it cost almost nothing to now it's costing when you extrapolate that 30% more. It's costing exactly. you 30% more over the course of a, 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 a loan to to borrow that money and not like that affects the entire business operation. It sure does. When I was young, interest rates were 18%. Yeah. yeah. And, and for the past 15 years, they've been 2%. For the past 15 years, they've been 2% trying yeah. to make up for some strategic weakness. And... Yeah. All right. Let's, uh, let's move on. But yeah, that, that one just kind of blew my mind when he, when he put it that way. I'm like, dang, I'm nowhere near 45. <laughs> Let's see. Um, there we go. From Senny, if you already have a Solutions Architect Associate Certificate, do you think a master's degree in information technology is important for the role of a cloud mm, architect? No, I would definitely not waste my time, effort, or money on a master's degree in information technology. The key is, Senny, you're going to be focusing on business, not technology. So while an MBA would be very helpful, getting a master's degree in technology is not going to help your career at all. In fact, it may show you as more of a techie and less of an executive, and it may actually hurt you when you really want to get to the elite level. So no, I don't think any kind of master's degrees in tech, I don't think any kind of cloud engineering degrees will ever be helpful if you're, if you're, all, if you're studying to be a solution architect. Study the tech. Learn the technology. Learn the business. I'm a big fan of MBAs. Four of my team members have them. Alonzo's got one. I've got one. Get your company pay for it, too. Yeah, and the company helped pay for mine. Francis has one. Look, we've got Anselm with a master's in economics, Eddie with a master's in law. And that makes our offering better for our students. We have two PhD B school professors. Why do we have business school professors here? Because that's the job. It's business. So I don't think focusing on the technology is going to build your architecture career. I think focusing on helping you can make your business, your customers more profitable with technology is the key to adding $100,000, $300,000 more to your career. Not I'm, another also, I'm also thinking as well, Mike, as quickly as we're transforming in tech, yes. the stuff that they're teaching totally in the curriculum will be totally outdated once you matriculate through the program. So it, it renders all that stuff and time that they taught you to learn all this stuff in earth. Oh, that's this, year, that's this year, we've had to retrain multiple people that had come from master's degrees in cloud computing and bachelor's degrees in cloud computing because they're taught stuff that's not related to the job. They're taught somebody the, best, the best IT that I learned was uh, Microsoft Office. Yeah. Like, literally, there was a class that taught me how to use Word, PowerPoint, Excel, and what was it? Access? Is that yeah. What it was? Yeah. And the no. sad reality is, as architects, well, we'll never be touching the tech. I promise you, we're going to make lots of Excel spreadsheets, lots of PowerPoint oh, documents, yeah. and oh, lots yeah. of Word documents. That's fifty percent of the job. I'm telling you, we're going to be doing a lot of that. Learning those uh, those equations, right, Mike? <laughs> King of Mesna, you're actually asking the wrong question when you ask how does a CCDP, CCDE compare to a cloud architect in terms of influence and so on. You understand the CCDE focuses on the network side. Well, here's the thing. I'm one of the original CCIEs. I'm going to tell you the CCDP is kind of nothing. Um, the CCDE is something like the CCIE. And here's the thing. I know lots of CCIEs, and I got paid you know, a quarter of a million dollars 20 years ago to do this. Well, I knew other CCIEs that were getting paid barely $100,000 a year. Now, what was the difference? Me, I was focusing on how I could use that network technology to improve my customer's business performance. And my other CCIE buddies were learning Linux and they were learning all this tech and they were techies, 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 and they were better techies. So the key is it's the same thing with the cloud architects are. If you don't focus on the business and you focus on the tech, 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 your salary is going to be on the low, low, low side. If you focus on digital transformation, it's going to be the high, high, high side. I know network architects earning a half a million dollars a year like nothing with $100,000 sign-on bonuses. And I know really good cloud architects and enterprise architects that could pay that well as well. It's not your certification. Your certification has nothing to do with it. It's what is the impact you can make on your customer's business as an architect. The better your leadership, the better your business knowledge, the better your sales skills, and the deeper your technology in your specialty. 
Do you understand the tech deeply enough and well enough and strongly enough that you can take those customers' business problems, translate them into a tech solution, build a beautiful plan, and give it to somebody else that costs much less to go build it for you? That's the secret to being an architect. But it's a good question. All right, this is from TM. I'm hoping to end up in the C-suite myself. It seems like a solutions architect role would have a natural lead into CIO, CTO, and CIS roles. Agree or disagree? Absolutely. In many cases, the solution architect or the enterprise architect or the cloud architect is a director level or VP level role. We've got students lending their first VP role. If it's a bank, as a solution architect. We've got other students that are getting you know, senior leadership level salaries. The reason the solution architect goes so nicely to these CIO roles and CTO roles is that's really the same job as the CIO. Develop the strategy for technology to meet the business's needs and then hire and make sure it run the departments of the people that can go build it. So yes, it's very natural progression for architects to go into leadership roles. I started mine in one and ended up in a team where everybody was a director and everybody had been a pre like chief financial officer of a hospital or chief medical officer or medical informatics officer. And I led a business council of all CIOs, CTOs, and CEOs to advise me of what they wanted in the next generation of products. So yes, very strong parallel between architecture roles moving into executive roles. Does being a jack of all trades, cloud architect, i.e. security, cloud security, infrastructure, data, et cetera, help develop the skills necessary to become an enterprise architect? Learning to become a jack of all trades is the surest way to a low salary in today's modern environment. What, what you need to do as an enterprise architect is master business. Look, when we speak to CEOs, when they say they're enterprise architects, they're like, I don't want a techie. I really don't. I want an executive that can talk to my executives. They can go work with the public cloud providers, work with their architects, and then coordinate the three different providers and all the other people to Palo Alto firewalls that are going to go, the two cloud providers, help negotiate the deals and put all the pieces together so we don't have to buy what the vendors are going to sell us because the vendors are going to sell us proprietary stuff that locks us into contracts. So the role of the enterprise architect is more about how good is your business knowledge? Now, any architecture role requires general knowledge of infrastructure and things, but we're never going to design it ourselves. At the enterprise architect level, can you lead a team of the 50 people necessary to get the job done? That's the thing. Not, do you know everybody else's jobs? Like, come on, worst way to be getting an enterprise architect job is to start at the bottom and focus on learning everybody else's job. That's part is to focus on what we do business transformation, digital transformation. Sorry, you might notice my big smile. It's because I'm reading the questions that are coming up. All right, let's go. Uh, all right, so Akin asked during the boot camp, will we be shown how to craft the perfect resume for the position? I saw that earlier. Akin, that's not the kind of things. We're doing free boot camps, so you don't have to buy a certification training anymore. That's the kind of things we do in our cloud architect career development program, teaching students how to write the perfect resume, having to get recruiters to come to them, how to build their brand, and of course, how to be an architect. That's not something we can give away for free. That's part of our main programs. And this one, this is one of the ones that got me to smile. So the truth is, if you don't have these certs, your resume might not even get through to the hiring manager. I will submit that certs are as required as the experience. I don't quite understand that last part, but you hit the nail on the head. That's the only reason we recommend certifications. they help you get It's just to get to the interview. But having said that, we get people like Delroy who have no certifications that are getting hired. Mm -hmm. Robert Welch, who just got an incredible job. His certification was a cloud practitioner, which is basically nothing. We had Jeffrey who had a cloud practitioner that got it. We've got plenty of students getting hired with zero certifications. The yes. key is, what are you doing for your brand, Abby? Um, what have you done? Does your resume show that you have the required skills? On your resume, the description of what you've done, is it relevant to terms of the hiring manager or did you put terms that you learned about in the certification bootcamp? Because I got to tell you, I see thousands of resumes. They say cloud architects, lost cloud engineer. 
You know what the first thing I do with it is I throw the thing away. Because if they don't know if they're a cloud architect or a cloud engineer, I can't even waste my time interviewing them. Yeah. So the key yeah. is, look, I can get lots of certifications past the hiring managers. I've gotten lots of people hired with zero certifications, but we like people doing certifications and we have a certification path that we recommend to help people get an interview. To help people. We, the, but yeah. nobody cares about your certification to hire you. Yeah. They use it as an interview tool, but as a branding tool. But we got people that we get people reaching out to them every week. Delroy not only rejected two of the three offers he got, he gets five plus people reaching out to him a day, cloud providers with no cloud service. But he has the right brand, he has the right message, he has the right knowledge, he's done the right things on LinkedIn, he's built his LinkedIn brand, he's built a following, he's done some things to get the world to know what is good. And that's what it takes. But we do like them because it helps get an interview, but you don't need them. And if you're doing if you're not getting the results or responses, there's something on your resume that's not right. I can tell you that right now. This is the other one that made me smile. So D Nice says, that's why I never understood why education is always so off, in all caps, from real world experience in any field. Why even bother and waste your time? I have my BS in IT uh -huh. and everything I learned is irrelevant to what employers look for. I could get on my soapbox. Yeah, I, I, I could, could get on it. about this all day long. I am the son of a college professor, two college professors at that, with combined teaching experience at university of like 70 years or something. I don't know. All over the place. You would think that I'd be the one preaching, go get your college degree and whatever you want to get. No, 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 no. <laughs> yeah. I'm yeah. the kind of guy that's like, don't even go to college until you've gone out and done something else for a little while and then yeah. and then you've determined okay i want to go to college because of an xyz and it's something very specific yeah um but then at that point i only recommend going to college you're going to be a lawyer you're going to be a doctor or in the medical field you're going to be in the aviation field you're going to be in some very highly specialized yep, yep. specialized yep. thing or you're going to go get a business degree right and we're and keep in mind <laughs> what 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 Chris didn't mention was finance book because my epiphany then when I found out was like, okay, you know, I talked to professors. They said, okay, well, you know, finance, why aren't you out there making tons of money? And they just had this question mark on their faces. Cause it's like all the stuff is antiquated. It doesn't work, you know? So it's like, you're pumping this information to all these thousands and thousands of people on stuff that doesn't work. So, mm -hmm. Get a business degree. Get a business oh, degree. Get a business degree. And, 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 you know, get something in MBA. You know, the funny thing is I did an MBA twice. Yes, you heard me. I did it twice. So what happened is when I was young, I was crazy enough to be getting a master's as a nurse practitioner and an MBA full-time while holding a full-time job. Yes, admittedly, I'm a little crazy. Now, I did this. I had a 4.0 at both universities. And here's what I started doing. I started studying tech. Worked as a nurse practitioner, worked in tech, and got my first tech job with zero degrees in tech and zero experience in tech. Six months later, I'm working on Wall Street designing the system as a, as a senior architect for the world's largest market maker on the NASDAQ, and I had no experience. A year later, I was a principal systems architect for a competitor to Cisco, and I was traveling two, 300,000 miles a year to present. And the thing is, nobody cared. They'd ask what my degrees were. And I'm like, oh, you know what? It's a nursing here. And then years later, so I quit the MBA program because I got a job that was the kind of job people dreamed about. Now, 20 years later, I felt bad that I didn't finish my MBA, 15 years later or something like that. So I called Drexel University where they gave me a pretty horrible business education. And I said, I'd like to come back. And they said, oh, well, we realized we had problems with our MBA when we first started it. It's not good enough. We're not going to accept your credits. And I went, okay, now that's for me. So I called Widener University where I did a previous master's degree. And here's what I did when I went to class. I worked in New York City. I lived in Princeton, New Jersey, and my school was right by Delaware. So I literally had about three hours, I'm sorry, about 10 hours of commuting most days going back to forth to school and work. And when I wasn't doing that, I had a three hour commute. On the way there, I listened to audio books. I went through 10 times more, but I had business experience. And now I knew what to listen to and what to basically tune out. 
They tuned out 50% of the MBA program, but there were certain things like bringing business cases and quantify the weight out of the cost of capital and economics and finance that really rounded me out. But yes, that's why I did what I did. That's why I came out of retirement. I don't need to work. People that know me know that. I've been retired since I was 34. And on the side, you know, coaching people for fun. I wanted to create something that was real world. That's how our students got hired. That's why people tell us it can't be done until they see our students getting hired. Every Daniel Bosu or Coyote or Yvonne Tambo that has that got hired with zero experience. It's relevant experience versus relevant education versus, you know, irrelevant nonsense like a cert or like most college mm -hmm. things. I'll never tell anybody to get a degree in computers. Anything to add there, Alonzo? <laughs> Drop the mic, man. <laughs> I wouldn't either. <laughs> you know, is is that that finance thing? It's like, okay, if you have the, it goes back to that, and this is applicable to IT as well. You you go through the whole process only to learn about tech that everyone swapped out years ago, or you talk about finance. Okay, if these are finance gurus, then how come they are not on Wall Street? mining ethereum bitcoin yeah uh, all the whole nine why aren't you doing it unless this whole setup needs to come in question and while we're here i see robert welch just popped in in the chat box um, robert how many people reached out to you to try and hire you each day on linkedin after our branding and robert while we're at it in the chat box let's talk about all the fancy cloud certifications you have like the certified solution architect or professional that you don't have and you still got a cloud architect job. And Robert, you know, we were honored and privileged to work with you. You're one of the finest cloud security people I've ever met. And I'm thrilled. But because people keep telling me you need a million cloud certs, let's tell everybody your cloud certs. And uh, while we're at it, um, let's get a hashtag cloud careers in the chat box as well. But Robert, in the chat box, you tell us, you know, all your fancy cloud certs that got you an incredible cloud, cloud security architect role. So while we're waiting on Robert to catch up with us, King asked, must cloud architects be on site? No. We travel. We go from business to business to business to business. I want to address um, the Mal Malcolm real quick. Um, we're going to take this out of context. Malcolm, first, thank you for your service, no matter what. Yeah. Malcolm, you will be successful no matter what. As a veteran, you have energy, enthusiasm, and passion. You generally know how to adapt, improvise, and overcome. And you've got a hard, never quit attitude. We could get you hired as a cloud architect long before you finish school. But Malcolm, we're not saying that getting education is bad. We're not saying it at all. You're just being a veteran gives you a tactical advantage over your competition. Now, granted, you'll have to learn a different leadership style from command and control to things that are there. And you're going to learn some of that in school. And we encourage you and we thank you for that. Don't feel small. Our plan is to let you know that you can do anything, truly anything. It doesn't matter where your education's in. I don't care if it's in nursing, accounting. It doesn't matter. What matters, Malcolm, is you and what you choose to learn and how do you choose to apply that in class. And Malcolm, take whatever uh, electives that you want that are going to make you happy. And while we're at it, be great. Malcolm, as a veteran, I'm sure you're going to be a great. I want to first thank you for your service, honor you and respect you, and never, ever, ever feel small. Nobody should feel small, but not a veteran. No, 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 Malcolm. We thank you for your service. We honor you and respect you more than you ever need. One can imagine. And guess what? How you use that education is how you use that education. It's not what they teach you in school. It's how you apply it and how you take it. And I'm sure with your background in the military, you're going to be able to separate the wheat from the chaff. Yeah. You'll be cloud hired soon. So thank you for your service, Malcolm. Sorry, just had to pick and that to, up. The chat. And, and to clarify, I, I'm the one that got on the soapbox here. My thing is the uh, average cost of tuition over the over the course of four years is almost $30,000. Yeah. And the overwhelming majority of people that go to college in the United States go into debt to go into college. And 
so it doesn't cost them thirty thousand dollars. It ends up costing them seventy five or eighty five thousand dollars. So that's why I am strongly not against or opposed, but I'm str I'm a strong believer in getting the right degree. If your passion if your passion is computer science, then you're going to be able to make a living out of it. You're going to be great. Um, I think you should probably get a minor or a double major, you know, not familiar with Texas A&M University, or if you might be at one of their satellite campuses, but, you know, look into being able to get a minor in management yes. or a double major in management and computer sciences. And the, the reason we, we, we speak to these is because these are going to help you in regardless of where you end up in your roles is get those take those management classes. And actually, uh, I'm assuming if you're in computer science, you have some passion about computer science. Yes. Take those management classes with the same passion because you'll learn a lot that will be applicable to any role that you do. So again, going back to me, I'm the one that was getting really feisty about that, but it's mainly because I am, uh, a lot of people go into, go into large amounts of debt um, without a good, understanding of the return on investment for what they're doing and so that, that's that's a, that's me and a society thing <laughs> and, and again malcolm it's not what your degree is and robert welch went in there and he said look i have the cloud practitioner and i got to tell you i know what his offer was and it was great so malcolm it's all about you all about what you learn and guess what it doesn't matter what your degree is in it really doesn't it matters what you know I used to hide that my first bachelor's and master's degree was in nursing. Now I use it as a joke. <laughs> Guillermo? Um, well, it depends on your job you want. If you want to be a cloud architect, don't study cloud engineering. Meaning if you want to be a doctor, don't go to law school, go to medical school. So my perspective is that. Now, Guillermo, I'll tell you that I've retrained several people that have gone there. And uh, one of the people that I've recently retrained is interviewing for a position. And when he went to interview for this position, here's what he told me. The interviewer liked him so much that he actually asked him where he got his career training because he wanted to send the internal candidate that applied for the same job that was a cloud engineer and he couldn't hire to our training to get him hired. <laughs> so there is that. So Guillermo, and I know you Guillermo, if you're the Guillermo, I think you are living in Mexico or Mexico City, and I, I just recommend that you study architecture if you want to be an architect and study engineering if you want to be an engineer. So. What's the next one? Well, Suleiman says, what exactly do DevOps engineers do? Okay, good. I like how you removed the word cloud from the DevOps cloud engineers because you're either a DevOps engineer or you're not a DevOps engineer. It's not like some simple cloud job. What a DevOps engineer really does is a DevOps engineer is a software developer. They have to be a software developer to be good at this job. So you need a good software developer because DevOps is the merging of software and operations. DevOps is kind of going away and something called SRE is becoming the new standard as DevOps may not have been as good or exciting as people thought it was. So DevOps is dwindling in the new form of that as SRE or site reliable and engineering, but that's okay. They're similar. And what does this, you know, it's about deploying your applications faster, using tools that can help do code checks, automating software releases, and accelerating the releases of software engineering. Now, it's also about deploying infrastructure as code on the cloud in today's world, where you get the cloud piece of it in the form of things like Terraform. It's about setting up and automating large Kubernetes deployments and working on microservices type architectures, kind of the exact opposite of an architect. This is someone that's a builder. Now, silly man, the reason I say that nobody should really waste their time on cloud admin careers is the reality is we don't need them. And here's why we don't need them. I can hire one DevOps engineer and they can automate the work of 50 people that were taught how to use the management console in a single person. So I can eliminate 50 people with one good DevOps engineer. So DevOps engineers automate for the most part, automating software releases, automating cloud deployments, infrastructure as code, 
in the form of, say, Terraform or Kubernetes thing, but more related to offers. So Cloud Architect designed the business solution with the technology, Cloud Engineer, build it out. DevOps Engineer is a career for a software developer. DevOps is another career where you're not just going to get a certification and get a job. Actually, none of these, because they're all professional careers. Yeah, even though, so even though it's not related, uh, I saw the word cloud engineers there. Uh, so we've had some questions about the cloud engineer program, um, and rightfully so, of course. I'll it's, address a, that. it's a good role uh, as yeah. of right now. But um, you know, I, I, I shared in the chat box that we've paused the enrollments at this time um, and that we don't, we don't have a time frame for, for when we might be, um, might be bringing them back to, but I know that you wanted to, that you were wanting to probably say something about that. So I just wanted to give you a chance, even though it's not DevOps, I just saw cloud engineers on the, and it made I'm me tell you right now, look, we're a business, right? We'd like to grow our business and we are intentionally pausing our cloud engineering program. And you would say, why would you pause a money making program? And I'm going to tell you right now, the economy is in a global recession. And let's face it, in the US, we've got two quarters of negative GDP growth at the same time, historic levels of inflation. Globally, we're seeing a recession as well. And what happens in a recession, Ash? What happens is organization hire people that bring people into the business and they lay off people that are expensive. So because we deal with these things, we, what our concern is, is if we take more cloud engineers into the cloud engineering program and there's a global shutdown, we want to make sure that the cloud engineers in our program get hired. And because we see a lot of competitiveness for cloud engineering careers, as organizations restructure and they bring in more revenue generating positions like cloud architects, business development managers, and sales, arch, arch, uh, sales uh, what do you call it? Um, sales reps, they're going to be laying off cloud engineering positions we see in the US, the UK, and Canada, and outsourcing them to lower cost of environments. So to make sure our students are successful, we're actually doing a couple of extra things with our students, which you didn't even tell them about yet, to make sure that they have the biggest competitive differentiators out of any cloud engineers in the world. And after our cloud engineers are hired, We'll think about reopening it again based upon what's going on in the economic environment. I want to make sure that our engineers and our program get hired and paid more than anybody else that's out there because I'm worried about the future of cloud engineering. I don't want to sell a course that I, I'm worried about the applicability of those people for the next year or two. That's why we're excited about architecture roles, excited about leadership roles, because anytime there's organizational restructuring, that's where we need our architects to go design it. But the people that build it, it doesn't matter if they're in Chicago, California, Cambodia, or Cameroon. And organizations will look to outsource. Akin, akin, to start applying for a solutions architect job, would you recommend us to have AWS Solutions Architect Associates? I recommend that you know how to design, present, and sell a solution. I recommend that you have high levels of executive presence, good levels of CXO relevancy, extremely good communication skills, sales skills, leadership skills, high levels of emotional intelligence. I recommend that you know the network and a data center and be able to take a customer's requirements and turn that into a solution. That's the ability to do the job. So I'm going to go for 10 more minutes, uh, Chris. I, I can't go beyond that because laryngitis, I got to rest the voice. For tomorrow. All right, Alonzo, entertain us with that soothing voice while I find some good questions. <laughs> so, that, so that Mike doesn't have to entertain us. <laughs> what do we have here? I, I guess you could, you could talk about what, uh, you could talk about the boot camp or talk about the webinar. Uh, on okay. Thursday. Yeah, what I, I definitely, well, I mean, I, I think let's, let's, Maybe we can have a quick um, thinking about what we can we can wrap up with, and we're done with all the questions for right now. Or we're um, I'm finding a couple. Uh, I'm looking for some good questions to close out with. So okay, I just I need a little bit of time. So I only need like a minute or so. Okay, okay. So based on um, just focusing on on the boot camp and 
the extensive time that we have. I just definitely want to, from the back end, from what we put into it, definitely want to give a shout out to everyone on the team, everyone who have participated in building this thing up. I really am, am just excited about how we have had a chance to really improve upon what we had last time get really into the weeds of getting everyone prepared for for the exam. I think it's going to be an exciting time. And I'm just really look, just basically looking forward to making sure that everyone um, gets that pass on that exam and can come back to us and say how well and how much um, it has really, really um, helped them in the, you know, to get them, get them that certificate. So I'm looking for that. All right, so make All sure right. you join us in the completely free How to Get Your First Cloud Architect Job webinar in on Thursday. I will go over the role, tell you everything you need to know, all the skills, technical and non-technical, to learn. And you can learn how we do it, and you can learn how to do it on your own. All right, so we're going to do some rapid-fire questions for you, Mike. You get 15 seconds to answer each sure. one. All right? Sure. All right. Um, oh my, I lost my place again. Is the cloud security architect plays a dual role as a cloud architect or cloud security? Ar no, they focus on security, not the cloud architect like me brings them into our roles to make sure our systems are designed. Totally specialist role. Certs are required for partnerships, aren't they? Well, if I'm a bank, I don't care if my people are certified. I'm not partnering with anybody. If I'm with AWS and I want my people certified, I can hire them without certifications and pay to train them. So that only applies for value added resellers. And they, if they want their people to be certified, will pay to send them for training. They'll pay their hotels, they'll pay their entire time. So that's only related to value added resellers, MSPs, but not you know the cloud providers themselves, not the businesses that hire them. How do I, as junior cloud practitioner, develop my skills to be a solution architect? And can I get my first job? Really tired, really tiring getting a first job. Of course, come to the, th the webinar on Thursday. We'll tell you how people like Delroy Bat with no cloud experience got hired. We'll tell you about people like Eva and Tamba who got hired. We'll tell you people like Coyote who got hired or Jennifer who was, who's never worked in tech who got hired. It's and not more, more, get, import, more importantly, he'll tell you how. I'll tell you how. Why? Like how? Like how and how why. How. It's not exactly hard to get how. into your first job. It's quite easy if you have the right skills. It's most people that don't have the right skills for the job. They've got somebody else's skills. I like this one. I'm not going to acknowledge it one way or another. In my opinion, search by these big corporations are big money making ah. machines for them. So that's a good, uh, that's a, that's a fair observation. I think it's a good observation. I think yeah. it's not about as much money as they make on third that. that they brainwash you to sell their stuff and lock yourself into only those things. So totally I think they're multi-billion dollar a year business for companies to have people get spending time learning these things. Yeah. So Dennis I, asked, um, he opened his own trucking business three years ago. Would that be relevant to a cloud architect to put on your resume? Yeah, Ooh, absolutely. There. There's plenty of things in your business to how to do. Manage fuel consumption, figure out how to do that, develop a plot of courses from point A to point B, manage timeframes, determining what you're using, the right equipment to use. Yeah, that's very valid because now you're focusing on the business of it. Now, not driving the truck, that's not that relevant. Although the reality is by talking to people along the way at various truck stops, you're probably developing different communication skills, but planning the trucking company Oh, yeah. Planning and logistics, so much business required. And by the way, I know people that literally are specialty architects focusing on just the transportation industry. What could be put in your resume? That's the kind of thing we teach in our program. Let's see. Jason Rendon, in lieu of certs, what's your opinion on writing, posting on LinkedIn, medium blogs, et cetera, as a way to help your career? Good question. Jason, we love it, but here's the key. 
it can help you or hurt you. For example, there's one tech company that's trying to teach people to get their job and they're making people write a 10 page blog on how to set up a web server. Now, here's the thing. Anybody that's been in tech knows sudo apt install Apache on a, on a Debian system like Ubuntu or yum install Apache on a Red Hat based system. So when people write 15 page blogs on that, they convince people not to hire them. By comparison, I've got students that get hired directly because they write a solution architect blog. And we talk about how this technology can impact business performance. And three days later, they're getting hammered by recruiters and hiring managers. So yes, I think it's great, provided we provide relevant content for the job and you prove you know the job. Uh, Iguan Wu, hey Mike, could you please explain these areas? Uh, he's a bit confused uh, regarding cloud engineer, cloud professional, and DevOps engineer. That's probably going to be a longer one. It's going to be a longer one. I did cover this earlier in the session quite heavily, so you could go back and watch it, or you could attend our How to Get Your First Cloud Architect job webinar, and we'll talk about it. But I'll tell you one thing. There's no such thing as a cloud professional. There's a cloud engineer, and there's a DevOps engineer, Cloud professional is just a made up term. And from TM, awesome stuff. Before this, I totally understood what Google Cloud did. I thought you were mostly another cert course. <laughs> no, we're not. We're not a cert company. We're, we're not, not at it all. Away for free. Yeah, we don't do that. We're, we're not going to pipeline you from one end to knowing any, not knowing anything to the other end of not knowing anything with a cert. So this is going to be our closing question here for you. Can I please talk more about the program? How long does it take? And so on. Well, King, that's actually up to you. And I'm going to address the second question, um, the second half of this. So the second you would sign up, you would actually be entered into our training. Our training occurs in three phases. Chris, can you go? Now, the reason I say how long it takes is up to you. I would say on average, it takes about eight to 12 months on average. Like I had a Richard Afukar get through my program in three weeks and get hired by AWS as a technical account manager. Poof, he was in and out in three weeks. But I've had other people that take 12 months. And really the key is how much time do you have? How much focus do you have? Are you going following directly our things? Or are you going off on tangents? Because I've got some pretty amazing students that go off on tangents. And we let them stay around a little longer because you know, sometimes that's appropriate for them where they figure out their desires. But generally speaking, it takes about eight to 12 months to get your first solution architect or cloud architect job. The way it works is you come to class. Now we have architecture classes and leadership classes which stand alone. And we repeat them about every 20 weeks or so. And that way everybody gets it. You know, we'll be in one class, we'll discuss the technology integrated to a design, another one integrated to a design. And those three classes are live on Zoom, so we get to interact with our students. Next on the list, you know, when somebody signs up, instantly they get brought directly into the self-paced part of their training. They'll watch a video, they'll read something, they'll do an assignment, they'll turn their assignment work in, and they'll get feedback on homework so they get better. Sometimes the assignment's good enough, sometimes we make our students resubmit the assignment until they get it right, because we're that. Thirdly, we have a lab component. And while cloud architects don't touch the tech, that's not part of our job, somebody might want to know if you've done it before. So we have people do like 25 basic labs on AWS. They're okay. They're basic labs. They're everybody else's certification labs. Why? So you can say you've done them. We have people do about 25 labs on Azure. Again, they're basic labs. So you can say you've done them. Certification labs. But then we have the real labs that give you real knowledge. Our labs include working with servers and server virtualization, so you understand what's going on behind the scenes. How do you build containers? Firewalls, VPN concentrators, so you're familiar with security. We'll have you build some minor web applications like the LAMP stack, and we'll train you how to do it. And of course, we'll teach you how to build file servers, Windows and Linux. Then we'll have you work with Active Directory, so you understand identity and access management, because that's big, that's what everybody uses. Nobody uses AWS IAM. They all everybody uses federated IAM to Active Directory. And then we'll have you design and build your own cloud. 
in our data centers. So you truly know what the cloud is because while others are worried about configuring it, you've designed and built your own cloud. You do that, you're getting hired. Of course, we've got resume training, salary negotiation training in there, leadership training, sales training, presentation training, emotional intelligence training. And it takes us about 500 hours of training to get you to your goals because we're not a certification training program. We are a get you hired program and we can't get you hired unless you're right for that job and have all the right skills. Okay. I think that's it. That's all you're allowed, Mike. <laughs> so we are going to wrap it up tonight. We'll of course be here in the morning for our regular Wednesday cloud career Q&A session. I have just put the link in the chat box uh, a few moments ago. Now we may not be here for the entire uh, normal two hours that we're here because we do have our boot camp. So it will be an abbreviated session tomorrow, but uh, we also have the, have the boot camp tomorrow. Um, and um, I'm going to uh reiterate that that you can join our how to get your first cloud webinar cloud job webinar on thursday where we will tell you exactly what you need to do to get your cloud first cloud job and how to do it on your own or how to do it with us we'll go over the program we'll also take any of your questions this will be on zoom so you can come off mute and ask questions um and uh, we, we really hope that you join us there. Um, and then let's see, I want to make sure I don't leave anything out. Make sure also follow us on LinkedIn. Um, we'll be updating you guys about all of all the things that we have coming up, uh, including any guest speakers, uh, future shows. Uh, we do this every Tuesday night. Uh, sometimes we have guests. Sometimes it's just us. Sorry, sometimes you're stuck with just us. But occasionally we'll have some uh, guests. Um, we'll have a vice president from NVIDIA, Alvin DaCosta, coming on soon. And, um, and then we'll, uh, we also have more boot camps coming up. We also have more workshops coming up, more interview practice coming up, all of that stuff that we tell you about on LinkedIn. So make sure you're following us on LinkedIn. Um, and then, of course, also, if you haven't done it already, make sure you like this video and then subscribe to our channel and hit the notification bells. That's just as important as follow us on LinkedIn. You now, if you hit the notification bell, you should, in theory, by YouTube, get notified that we have things coming up. So do that if you don't want to miss anything else. Um, let me see, let me see. Normally I don't do this. I'm trying to save Mike's voice. So give me, give me just a few seconds. Um, then of course we've got the new and updated exam guide. Mm. So you can register at the link that Leo is going to share to get your copy of that. That's 100% free. And then last but not least, since it is Cyber Security Awareness Month, we have a 30% off discount code uh, security, the word security, very simple. Uh, for 30% off all of our training content, uh, career development programs, tech career accelerator leadership programs, the interview training um, app that's applicable to full payments, that's applicable to payment plans, all the, the payments in a payment plan, not just the first one. Mm -hmm. So make sure to take advantage of that and share that with anyone that might be able to take advantage of that to better themselves and get cloud hired or get cloud promoted. Again, that's code security for 30% off all of our programs and all of our payment plans. Um, so we'll be back here again in the morning at 10 a.m. Eastern time. And we will also have day two of our AWS Certified Solution Architect Associate Bootcamp tomorrow at 12 p.m. Eastern time. If you missed today, you can go and watch the recording on our channel and be caught up and join us tomorrow. I don't think I've got anything else. Um, Alonzo, anything for you to add? And then we'll let uh, Mike close it out. Yeah, I think it's, uh, I think you said it all. I feel like, you know, we're closing out a great sports game. 
Um, I think we had some pretty good questions here. You guys keep it coming. We always love the interaction. We want to make sure that not only do you like and subscribe, but join, you know, invite somebody to come on in, um, check out the uh, podcast. Uh, maybe you all can have a, a discussion about what we're discussing and and, and uh, expand everyone's knowledge of the cloud together. So um, as always, always glad to, to see Mike and Chris and interact as we do. And uh, looking forward to the next round, part two of a, of a, of a week long of us uh, uh, sharing uh, cloud knowledge and as Mike rears it up and, and gets it going uh, for tomorrow's boot camp. Yeah, and there's actually one thing I, f I completely forgot about is we do have a contest going on right now. Yeah, that's right. But I forgot all about that. Sorry, I'm not the best promoter in the world. Uh, so <laughs> I do what I can. But I'm going to put it here in the chat box. Uh, we made a post last week about a contest that we have. If you want a chance to win a free enrollment in our Cloud Architect Career Development Program, I just shared the link to the, uh oh, I went kind of, my focus went out. Um, I just shared the link to the, to the instructions for that contest. Make sure to do all of those steps for your chance to be entered uh, to win one of four uh, free enrollments. We'll be announcing uh, one uh, winner each week over the next four weeks. So make sure you do all of those steps. If you don't do all of those steps, you won't be eligible to win. So make sure to take advantage of that. Make sure to join us for the boot camps. Make sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell. Make sure to follow us on LinkedIn and everything else that I forgot to tell you. So Mike, I'll let you end it and we'll see everybody tomorrow. So Mike, last word. We loved having you on tonight. My team is protecting my voice because I've had a little bit of laryngitis because I'm on camera so much to help all you guys get hired. Tomorrow morning at 10 a.m., bring us all your career questions. We'll do anything we can to help you get cloud hired. And, of course, at noon tomorrow, we'll be here to truly help you and give you your second day of the AWS Certified Solution Architect Associate 2022 Boot Camp. If you can guys get, can give me in the, in the, in the chat box, cloud architect or a cloud engineer based upon your goal career. We always want to know who you are. And heck, if you want to add a hashtag cloud hired, we love that too. Thank you so much. And we'll see you all tomorrow. We have a wonderful week prepared for you. Free eBooks, um, free training, and a lot of other great things coming soon to boost your Mike, uh, Mike, I went over all this so you wouldn't have to. <laughs> Make that voice. <laughs> Get the rules. Okay. <laughs> bye, bye, everybody. Welcome, I'm cutting, I'm cutting them off. I'm cutting them off. <laughs> Good night.